Disclaimer, we'd like to note before the start of this interview that the opinions about to be expressed by the guest on tonight's Get and Sell at the Experience podcast are that of the guest and do not directly or necessarily reflect the views of the host of the Get and Salty Experience podcast. You're listening to the Getting Salty Experience Podcast. Hello! Hello! I'm giving a shout out to Ellie Kubler tonight, my mother. Yep. I got to get her early because she falls asleep all the time. I started watching. I don't know. I woke up and it was morning. I don't know what happened. So I got to get her early before she falls asleep. I wish night. I could go to sleep and fall, get, wake up in oh, the morning. Yeah. yeah. I'll yeah. tell you what. I Welcome agree. back to the Getting Salty Experience podcast. It's the only one that brings the fire out to the table. And, dude, so how much more? I mean, so much more. I can't tell you how much. How much? We bring what? it all. Yeah. History. Great guests. What else? Lessons. Training. Gonzo's nice head of hair. What else do we bring? Louis Louis hunting tips. Coob's commentary. My commentary. We bring and Lou's, Lou's funny faces right now. He's chewing his lip. Like I go, oh, shut up, bitch. How, how old is your mom now? <laughs> she 80 what? 85? 85. Holy mackerel. Still 85, laughing. Man. She laughs That's... every day, that lady. Talk to her every day. Love her. Love her yeah. pieces. I definitely didn't see her when I was up there last time. I have to see her next time on my next trip up. Oh, you didn't? That's right. No, we didn't she was get doing Pilates stuff. or something. She's always working out. She's doing everything. No, she ain't doing Pilates anymore, but she's she's up and about all the time. Yeah, I see that. She gets around. You know, she's like yeah. a little deuce coop. She's yeah. my little deuce coop. Boop, 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 boop. She, is yeah. she getting stuff? No. No, nah, she's still pretty sharp. I forget yeah. just as much stuff as her. <laughs> 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 she laughs every day. You gotta love it. She laughs every day. She loves the show. Who's yeah. on tonight? Who's on? Who's Simon the... or is he an yeah, office? So Fino. Oh yeah, he got a real Italian tonight. What was oh. his? Email? He's getting a lot of O's lately. A lot of what O's. was his email though? He had an email that was like Italian something. Italy like... rocks or something at AOL. Italy. Or... FD yeah. FD Italy. Forget about it or some shit FD, like that. Italy. <laughs> Gabriel Gold. Gabriel Gold. Tony, get the uh, Gabriel Gold over there. That's what he said. You got the Gabriel Gold? Forget about it. That's what he said. That's what sign on. <laughs> I think that's that should be the word of the day. If we had to forget about it. We haven't done that in a while. Word of we the have. day. Yeah. yeah. All right. We're that's the word of the day. I just said it. The word of the day is forget about it. Forget about it. You got to do the face though. My wife hates that face. Forget, forget about, about it. it. Forget about. It. I can't wait to see what Patty Lee comments is going to be tonight. Oh, <laughs> every another time it's like, it's like it's like another great, <laughs> great another I think Italian. It's an Irish <laughs> even the other guy the other night, even though he was from Baltimore, Kobo, he must have been Italian, right? Kobo, what was that? Uh, he seemed like it, right? We got yeah, he did seem like it. Seemed like no, no, we have this. I, I'm going to do the lightning round with the captain tonight. I know what, what his favorite meal is going to be. Patty <laughs> Lee wrote, I can feel my dinner coming back on me. Uh, <laughs> oh, you didn't get to that shit yet. Oh, <laughs> Patty Lee is probably boiled meat and, and uh, cabbage, right? That's what he was eating tonight. Some boiled shit meat and cabbage. <laughs> ketchup. Or ketchup on it or something. Uh, so I got to take uh, me and Lou Lee are going to go to a Ranger game. We gotta, I got to get find a game. We're going to go to the Ranger game. I don't get the invite. What happened? You, you want to come? Yeah. I'll go. All right, you're in. Even though nobody, nobody cares, cares about, about hockey, <laughs> <and that includes laughs> for that night, I'll care about hockey. Just uh, right. yeah, well, Just you know, it's like going to a Yankee game. You have to, you know, kind of like the Yankees for a you little. You know, what we'll do. I'll drive. We'll pick him up. I'll come up, pick him up by his house. I'll plow right into his Slam garbage, into his cans, garbage cans. Yeah, Slam nice. into his garbage cans. We'll throw the old codger in the back of the car. <laughs> like to hit the it'll, be, it'll be like old school when they grab the old guy off the, off the street. You say anything to anybody, I'll kill you. I'm only kidding. I'll have him back by night. <laughs> it's my boy, Blue. Uh, Blue, that boy. He said that means we have to bring the booster seat. He's got oh, lines. He's, he's pretty sharp what? for an old codger. Man, man he's quick. Man. He, he don't miss a beat. He don't miss a beat, and he'll throw a can down the hallway like it's nobody's business. Right <laughs> that this is so. true. This is true. Yeah. All right, listen, this is the big week. This week, come and see me and Louie. We're going to be at the show. Right, guys? Put it up there. It's coming. Where did I put it? 
I'm coming, I'm coming. And that includes yeah. Yeah, Boom, there it is. is. Yep, and we're Second 140, one. booth 142. Come out to 142. I know Procaccini's coming. I know the little guy's coming. A little uh, 21 truck television. Oh, Procaccini might be coming with the big kahuna over there. You know what a big kahuna is? Oh. Right? Oh. Well, Bobby. Well, Bobby M, maybe. Oh, Bobby. Really? You coming on the show, Bobby Morrison? Bobby. Fresca. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about a Fresca? Mm -hmm. Fresca, you come on the show, Bobby. Mm -hmm. Maybe you force a few doors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think there, Chief? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Do you think uh, our what? guest has seen any of this? We got three, two, and a rescue, multiple phone calls. Sounds like a job. <laughs> <laughs> That's him saying that. That's what that is him, as a matter of fact. On the, on the radio, we got three, two, and four uh, in town on the glass. Back in 283, I think. You know? Back in the day. It did work in the Bronx. Yeah, uh, well. yeah for about uh, 30 seconds. <laughs> but we'll talk about that. Yeah. He does have a good head of hair for an older gentleman. It does. Yeah. Yep. Tim and Gonzo are going to uh, trade hair secrets later. We have an actual little secret there. My old uh, towel ladder, which originated from 170 after 9 11, did a full circle and ended up in his quarters uh, right after 9 11. Uh, Say while that you again? guys. That convoluted story you're telling me? What? Our, my old volunteer department, my old towel ladder. The, you know, the Baker Scopes back in the day in this concert. Yeah. It was originally from 170, uh, 170 excuse me. 170, uh, and it wound up we in 127 quarters? After 9-11. It was with, in our company, in our firehouse, and after 9-11, it relocated back to 127. Really? Uh, I mean, yeah. A little but you bit were a Florida at the time. You were a chief. Yeah, Florida, but I, yeah. Well, no, I wasn't a chief then, but it was just oh. interesting to see the that picture of that rig in uh, their fire. Oh, he has firehouse. the picture? I, I've been trying to find it, but I, oh. Jimmy Gales, Chief Gales at the time, he's the one who told me the, the story of, Did you get of a, our a little boing as soon as you saw it. No, no boing, no boing. No, no, no wait, oh, wait, no, I can't do that now. There's no time for that. There's no time for boings. Boing. <laughs> you gotta have that thing closer to you, bro. You've been so oh, I got 10 pages of sound effects that I gotta scroll through. <laughs> mark, mark to mark them. Do you have I, they mark? are marked. They are I, everything I have is marked. All right, let's know? get to the uh, ads. all right, yeah, let's go. Let's do the ads. Come on, I don't want to keep the I don't want to keep it in the back because, you know, you got my guy all wrong. Maybe, I don't know. Nobody puts baby in the corner. All right, here we go. Here. Armor Tough Firehouse Flooring was recently installed in station number seven, the newest of the DeKalb County Fire Stations in Decatur, Georgia. Meeting Deputy Chief Smith of Support Services, Vince explained that Armor Tough Interlocking Flooring is the only floor that is tough enough to withstand the abuse of fire apparatus, along with fire personnel at a very busy station. Chief Smith explained, The flooring in all of our stations over the years gave us multiple problems. We need a floor that can last as long as the walls and the roof. That's why we chose Armor Tough. The installation team came from New Jersey, and in three days, they had completed their work without any disruption to our daily operations. We were very impressed with not only the product, but with the workmanship as well. I highly recommend Armor Tough for your station's floor. Call Vince today for a no-obligation quote at 908-917-7697. Hmm. Excellent. Vince will be at the show too, so come see him. But you got to look down because he's really short. So if you want to find him, he's actually he's short. He's perfect eyesight for you, though, right? right. Oh, oh I was say, can you imagine Coops pointing somebody's? Yeah, you right. Out? Can you? I was... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Is that you the last? Like... We got any more? That's it. I think that's all we got today, right? All right. That's it. Get him in here, Ruff. You're the man. You're the man, Master of Ceremonies. All right, you ready, Gons? Yes, I'm ready. Let's sure go. you got a, you got the right sound effect. You good? No, no, take it easy. Yes, I All have. Right. All right, coming to the stage, <laughs> Captain Craig Silvino. Oh! <laughs> I think I actually have I think I actually have a better intro for him. Come go. I got, a, I got a golf story about Gobble Gold. <laughs> bring the nozzle. Forget the cannolis. No, bring the cannolis out of the nozzle. Leave the gun and take the cannolis. No, yeah. But we need the nozzle. Welcome to the show. Thank Thank you. Little, uh, Thank you for having me. Your, your buddy's in there. I saw him checking in. Bobby 283. Yeah. He's the one that put this whole thing together. He says, I got a guy for you. Yeah. And I'm my son blew up with people that. 
today. Uh, good, good luck, good luck, good luck. And I'm saying, all these people that contacted me are all good people that don't want me to tell a story about them. Ah, <laughs> trying to be nice to you. I don't tell yeah. anyone that I uh, shit my pants in the back of. Uh, <laughs> oh, shit. oh, oh shit. wait, we gotta get patriotic guns yeah. before we get ahead of ourselves. Yes, for sure. Here, Here we, we go. Missed. Here we go. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Excellent. Nice. Excellent. Beautiful. All right, Cap. Let's yes, dive Cap. right in. Talk about the early days back when, Ma, would your mom call it gravy or sauce? What she used to call it? Well, it was gravy if you put meatballs in it. It was sauce if there was <laughs> no right. meat. Let's go back to the old days where you grew up when mom was making the gravy. Where was that? Where'd you grow up? Well, I grew up in Douglaston, but the cheap side. I was going to say, wow, you had some cash over there, huh? So if you go on in LIE and you're between Marathon Parkway and Douglaston Parkway, you look up on a hill, there's a bunch of garden apartments called Beach Hills. Uh -huh. That's where I grew up. It was a thousand square foot apartment, four of us, two bedrooms. <clears throat> my old man took my dresser and my brother's dresser, stacked them on top of each other, one facing one way, the other one faced the other one, put a wall down the middle, and made it into uh, prison for the two fire hazard. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, if anything happened, my brother was dead. Frank, save yourself. So I grew, up, buddy. I grew up in what we used to call the Jewish Alps, because if you came to my house during Christmas, make a left, make a right, you see a Christmas tree, that's my house. Otherwise, it was all menorahs. Oh, no shit. And, you have a yeah. shining light on the hill. Yep. <laughs> but, uh, what yeah, no, I went for a living. My father was on a job. Oh, ah, now the plot thickens. What did yeah. he work? Okay. My father started in 230 and I think 1957. Um, and then in 1969, whatever, 70, he got promoted and he went to 60 engine and he did uh, the 70s and 60 engine. Wow. And then it, then that's that's him, uh, the lieutenant. Um, wow, and uh, then from there, he uh, he went to 306 for like the last two years, and then he was done. Uh, 1985. Oh, before you got on, then, yes, before I got on, yes, he was influential and getting you on the job. Uh, well, uh, you know, it's funny, my father never took me to the firehouse, never took me to anything to do in the firehouse. We, I never you know, went to. That's a few guys who have said that, which yeah. is a little weird to me, but I, a few guys have said that on the, on the show. Very recently, too. It wasn't like yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. a couple weeks ago. The 230 engine I never was in. Um, 60 engine. I was The first time I was in the firehouse is when my dad passed away and they put his name on their wall. That was the first time I was oh, ever in that firehouse. Really? Yeah. What about like so, picnics and stuff? You wouldn't go to the picnics or they didn't have them? Or? Well, a your intro of all your, let's say, Southern European ethnic jokes. <laughs> they, it was the Columbia Association, and my father was on the board. Ah. So I grew up, yes, that's me and uh, well, Paul Cressy, who retired as the chief of safety. Um, uh, one of our first parades, me and him carrying the flag. But, you know, I went to the, the Colombian picnic, the Colombian trips, the Colombian dance. The Col I started going on vacations. That was the big thing, you know, because that, that's what my dad could afford. We'd go to the Poconos. Every year we went to Mount Airy Lodge. There'd be 2,000 firemen. And back then, you had to march in the parade to get an invite to go to Mount Airy. That's how crazy it was back then. Because it that's was the, the Goombas were up there, though, right? Was, a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. <laughs> and I went. So I grew up not with the firehouse, but with all the Italian firemen on the job. And, you know, Sal Cassano, 
the Mayo, Al Cilio, uh, De Padova. The Smithwick, the Smithwicks, right? The Smithwicks, I was telling the story about. But all these staff chiefs and, and people who became, you know, the, the towers of our job. I was 10 years old. I was playing the racquetball with them. You know, I didn't know them as, you know, a, a three-star chief. I knew them as Joe. Wow. So, but, well, that's how I met the Smithwicks. You know, we grew up once a year going on vacation together. And Joe, Michael, um, all the rest of the clan, you know, we once a year, we'd be in Mount Airy Lodge for the weekend having a blast. And then, you know, even... Um, Oh God, I just forgot his name. Anyway, we 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 grew up together, and then wound up getting on a job and saying, "Oh yeah, oh yeah, remember this, remember that, remember that." And the story I was telling you before was, the Smithwicks always took the room, and it had a glass. The whole wall was glass. It was down the alleyway to get to the nightclub, and on Friday you would be able to look into the room and say hi, whatever. The Smithwicks are pounders. By Sunday. You couldn't see in the room. It was, <laughs> it was just empty cases of beer. <laughs> it was hysterical. I mean, but they would sit there and have a blast, have the best time. We'd hang out with them. And I, I was saying, they, they got a grab. They uh, The Smith, the owner's dog, went across the lake and fell in. And they went right into action. They put the beer down, which I was surprised. <laughs> would have been better if they did it with the beer in their hand. <laughs> you get an A I, for that, Captain. I Michael put it down. Joe, I, Joe, I'm not too sure. <laughs> but they they took it out and they they saved the owner's dog, which was pretty cool, you know. Oh, but that was good. that was my childhood with the fire department. As far as anything to do with the actual firehouse and the department, my father sheltered me from that. He kept me away from it. Wow. Um, it was it was not in his plan for me to be on the job. Um, I had, he, he didn't want you to. Or he just he was indifferent towards it. No, he just he wanted something better. My, you see, I have an older brother, five years older, Nikki, greatest guy you ever met. You would never know. But at the age of ten, decided he wants to be a doctor. He goes through elementary school, middle school, goes to Cardozo in, in two years with the SP program, goes out to Stony Brook, bangs that out in three years, and then goes to NYU Med School. So, you know, my whole life growing up, you know, going through school, hey, Craig, you know, oh, are you related to uh, Nicholas Levine? I go, yeah, that's my brother. I hope you're as cool as he is. Not even close. <laughs> Not even close. I'm going to be in the dean's office. We're going to be in the dean's office. So it's not going to work. But uh, so, my, you know, it wasn't that he, my father didn't want the fire department. It was he wanted me I not to go it. through what That's he right. went through. And um, so did your brother become a doctor after all of that? Orthopedic surgeon. Oh, man, that's hard. Um, orthopedic surgeon. Well, well you know, he, he probably had quite a few of these. So he yeah. did. He had a couple of those. <laughs> <laughs> so he had the gun? Sure. Oh, yeah. Like, he probably has this when he runs around with both hands and he throws his things up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my battery's getting weak. What do you got? I want it old-fashioned. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but, um, but he, my, brother, my brother's a class act. You know, you wouldn't even know he had a dollar in his pocket. He's just a regular guy. He, he can hang with the rest of us he's just aces and i remember fighting you know my dad like pushing me away you know you're going to college you're doing this you're doing that and this and i remember the day the argument stopped and it was because i said to my father if my family turns out half as good as yours how bad can the fire department be and that ended it wow it, you pulled one out of nowhere it, I, it just End the like, conversation. Now he's bringing a mask home for me to run up and down the fucking stairs. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. You, know, you, you pulled the card. Now we got to go with it. Wow. And, That's uh, it. You, did, you put all your chips in. Now we got. God, yeah. we have another picture, don't we, of his, of his father? Didn't oh, yeah. I have quite a few. I was just waiting. I was yeah. waiting for the right. I have actually, uh, we have this one where he was injured. Yeah. In 230, he was in a major, major collapse. And, uh, Wow, what year is that, Cap? It's got to be, uh, you know, 50s, uh, early 60s. Very, That's very a great enough. picture, man. Look at the guy next to him smoking a cigarette. Having a blast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Your father's bleeding from everywhere, and this guy's walking by with a cigarette, firing with a cigarette in his hand. It looks yeah. like a cigarette, right? Yeah, that's yeah. definitely a cigarette. It's probably back a camel, then. camel back then, right? <laughs> yeah, and no filter. 
yeah. I have another so, one of uh, same job, just so uh, yeah, reference. Yeah. Oh, you look so, like him there, definitely. Yeah, no, we definitely look alike. He's, uh, but he, you know, uh, my career was, uh, my father was a good man, and uh, he. You know, the, the, the things that because of my dad and the, I was able, I as I said, you know, I'm playing. That's me being sworn in. Um, and I'll, t I'll tell you that when we get to the part about me being in the Bronx, I'll tell you that story. He but, looks happy there. Look at him. Yes, he's happy. Uh, he was my, my father was very happy that I got on the job once once he got over. This is, you know, this is the best he's going to make of himself. <laughs> yeah. you know? we're, we're, Listen, we're every parent there. wants their every parent wants their son to to be yeah. better than them, right? So, uh, yes. the well, my, in, my, in a way, you know. Yeah. Well, my father took a beating, and and you know, back then they were getting their balls beaten. Yeah. Okay. You know? and he was like, you know, you know, maybe you want to do something with your brain, right. you know, and uh, but he, he, you know, he wants wants to. Once the gauntlet was dropped, he was all in, and we, we had a plan. He was awesome. He, we, you know, and, and again, like I, I said, my my dad, because of my dad, because of growing up with the Columbia Association and with um and the five his buddies and his friends used to take me fishing as a kid and things like that, and you know, made my job. When I got on a job, I knew I was not going to embarrass anybody. This is I'm all in. This is the best thing in the world. And I'm on this. I'm on this train, and I'm going to make sure that I make it a little better than I get get it. How'd you know? your mother feel about it? Mother was not thrilled. You know, never she was, <laughs> most most mothers never really are. She was, she was very supportive. She unfortunately, you know, she my mom passed in fifty. Uh, she was fifty seven years old, nineteen ninety one. Um, long, here's a long story short. So my. When my brother wanted to go to med school, my father basically told him, listen, I got it. I'm paying for it. When you graduate and you become successful, I want a membership to a golf course. And that was the deal they made. All right. So my brother becomes successful out in California. My father, what got him basically off the job, he got sick with uh, sacidosis with his lungs. And they put him out, and um, my brother buys him a house in Palm Springs, California, on PGA West, on the tenth hole of the Arnold Palmer course. <laughs> he did the right thing Good for him. So, unfortunately, they were going to do six months back and forth, and on their way home after the first year, we were out there, and in in a strange world that we're in, the after the first six months that they're in that house my brother calls me up he says can you get a week off i says yeah well what's up he says well they, they're going to drive back to new york why don't you come out to california i'm going to take a week off we'll spend the week with mom and dad and then they'll drive, drive back home. Yeah, drive home. so i go out to california we have the greatest week in the world we have a lot of laughs a lot of sauce a couple of gravy dinners and then um i get on i take the red eye Back home, I land in Kennedy, drive right to the firehouse, do a 24. And when I get to the steps, my girlfriend, who now my wife, is sitting on the steps and she goes, You got to go back to California. Your mom and dad were in a horrible car accident. Oh my God. And, uh, you know, my mother held on for 10 days. My father got banged up, but he was fine. And it just fucked everything oh, up. Shit. But, um, so, you know, the good, bad, the happy, sad, you know, it's it's a strange world we live in, but it was pretty, you know, uh, my brother paid the bill and it was it was unbelievable. We what he did for my dad and my the father deserved it and uh, we we had a lot of good times. So, uh, it was nice. Um Is your pop still around? No, my father died. God, it's got to be 15 years now. Um he was uh, he was 80 84 years old. He he did he beat the system. Yeah, he beat the system. He had to live out in California. He couldn't live in New York. He get off the plane in New York, and you could just hear him breathing, you know. Yeah. But he, he he remarried. He he met a nice lady, and they they were out in California, and he he did good. He did fine. He uh, he won. He was, but he was uh, 
he was a good man and my my life was a lot easier because of the groundwork that my father did the fire department you know well, so hey, hope my kids say the same thing about me yeah, yeah. oh yeah that's the best thing you can get Set yeah right but, so, uh, so i guess i gotta get back on this timeline right no, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I was going to say, so you get. Uh, I love that stuff. I love that shit. Yeah. But I was, in the, you know, I went to Cardo's High School. That, uh, you know, I, I ran that Burger King on the corner of Cross Island and Northern Boulevard. You know, had a blast. And uh, Have it your my, way. Brother, my brother tells me, <laughs> you know, you're going to college. And I go, no, I think I'm going to become a Marine. He goes, no, no, you're going to college. I said, no, I really, I, I think I want to be. He says, no, no. So I said, all right, I guess I'm going to college. So, you know, I look, my brother went to Stony Brook and my parents used to show up on the weekends. So I was like, well, fuck this. Oh, what happened? That's Lou. Lou he just, I just said, he just so, said, you can keep going. <laughs> so I, I look at all the state universities and, oh, Buffalo. Nobody's going to come showing up on the weekend. <laughs> Who the fuck's going to come all the way up to Buffalo? Yeah, nobody. <laughs> I'm going to Buffalo. So I went to UB. And uh, I was up there, uh, uh, you know, I was up there forever because I was up there for seven years. I'm not a doctor because I was waiting for the fire department. I took the test, the written test. I took in, God, I guess it was 81, 80, 82, I think. Right. Um, and, um, I was waiting for the job. So, you know, my father would say, when you come back to New York, and I'd say, Dad, I got a two bedroom condo. I'm I'm running a bar and nightclub on campus. I'm making twenty five thousand dollars a year. I got a pool and a garage. I'm paying two twenty a month. I'm not coming <laughs> back until five o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, all right, okay, as long as you're okay. And it was fine. And then uh, the job called. I gave my two weeks notice. And I was, and I came home and went right to the academy. And, uh, you well, know, I had a great with you. Any, uh, any names that we know in the academy with you? Sure. It was Dwayne Wood. Dwayne Wood. Dwayne, Dwayne Wood. That's, uh, and uh, right Mike Gala, uh, Kiefer. I'm trying to think of all the people that kept on going. I mean, you got, uh, That's you know, Donald, uh, right. again, we had 125 guys. We were the boys of the summer. Um, and it was it was interesting, you know. The first day we get well, I'm gonna go to my first day being sworn in. You have that picture, mm -hmm. but I'll tell you how I had my foot in the mouth within maybe 30 seconds of being on the job. So we walk on to the rock, you know, the day you're getting sworn in, you're in civilian clothes, you still have your hair on your head, and as I'm walking down the alley there, I see Captain from the Rock. And I look, and he goes, why are you eyeballing me? <laughs> so I go, That's my line. I know you. Because <laughs> I know him from the Columbia Association, from one of the trips. Right. You know, and he goes, you don't fucking know me. I said, yeah, I do. He goes, shut the fuck up. And get inside. I'm like, all right, this is going well. <laughs> so I got that going. For so me. I go inside, <laughs> and you know, behind the auditorium, everybody's hanging out behind the auditorium. You know, I, I I knew Jerry DeMeo. I didn't know him. I knew his uncle, which was Joe DeMeo, who at the time was chief of fire prevention or whatever. And then, well, I'm talking to Jerry or whatever, and all of a sudden, this captain comes over to me. He goes, "You don't go to your seat." You're going to come inside with me. I got a special seat for you. And I'm going, so this is good. I got 30 seconds. I didn't even swear in, and I'm ordering the dean's office. <laughs> I'm going, my father's going to be real proud of me. So anyway, we go in, and he grabs me, and he sits me front row all the way on the left, last seat. All right. He says, you sit here and don't say a fucking thing. Okay, I can do that. So the whole ceremony starts. How the story starts? Now we're going to swear in. Of course, Spinato says, "You on the left, you on the right, come up on the stage." Just yeah, this is you, right? <laughs> 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 there you are. <laughs> <laughs> 
Sorry. There we go. No, you're not wrong. Not wrong. You're not wrong. So, so me and uh, Jerry DeMeo are up on stage. That was the photo you had. And we're being sworn in. And we get the photo, which was his plan. You know, he's, but I don't know that. I'm thinking I'm getting fucked with. And but the idea was to get me up on stage and be sworn in. So now we go outside. Now your family's there. And I see my father talking to the captain. And I'm going, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> Already the first day and I'm set up. And again, it, it was just hysterical. But within six seconds of being on a job, I'm already fucking nuts. Right, and they, they yeah. hounded me. They hounded Jerry. <laughs> um, because uh, Sacramento, Deep Adobo, all those guys work with my dad. So, and, you know, not only did they work with them, but they knew. So they, they had. Sacramento was back there, all the way back then. Sacramento, yep. Yeah. I'll step on your cock. I'll step on your cock. I'll step on your cock. He was only a captain back then. But, he was uh, always a captain. He got, he got promoted. Uh, yeah. Whatever. Was, whatever. Yeah. But, um, so, yeah, I don't know if you remember. The old days, the bosses, the, the instructors used to sit up above in the tower where tactical training was, but there was just the railing. There was no walls, and they can look down into the cafeteria where you sat. And you were told, never look up, because if you look up, they're going to make eye contact with you and go, get the fuck upstairs. And they would either hammer you and make you get coffee, whatever, <laughs> all, you know, all good stuff. Don't get me wrong. So one day, me and Jerry are having lunch. Couldn't help yourself. You couldn't help yourself. No, no, wasn't my fault. Uh, wasn't my fault. No, I hear you. I hear Silvino, the mail upstairs. Oh, here we go. So we drop up, we run upstairs. You know, you weren't allowed to have your boots on the second floor, the whole nonsense. We're standing at attention, and they just rip into Jerry. You're a fucking slob. Look at you. <laughs> yeah, you know, your is out, your shirt this. Remember, look at Silvino. He's all lined up. Everything's creases. And that was only because my mom used to do my father's creases. So she did my creases. So I'm, um, you know, look at Silvino. He looks great. Look at this. You're a fucking mess. And all of a sudden, Teddy Fret says, Are you two fucking dating? <laughs> and I don't know why, but I yell out. Sir, yes, sir, but we're seeing other people, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, the whole floor up to all the instructors, they're not sure if they're allowed to laugh, but they break out of laughing. Get the fuck downstairs. The last time anybody bothered me, or sorry, that was it. It was over. But, uh, yeah, no, I, it was, uh, we had a lot of fun in pro school. That's and, cool. you know, it was eight weeks, but the last week we painted and pulled weeds. You know, yeah. but um, and that was like Friday if the guy showed up for uh, fire marshal training. Half the time he wouldn't show up. You know, so, so this, this is what I got to ask you right here. You get assigned okay. to engine sixty three. Okay, so here's the point. Hours and then yeah. reassigned to two ninety eight. <laughs> yes. So, so I got Teddy Fred. Couple other guys busting my balls. Where you going? Where you going? Where you going? I, I don't know where I'm going. Whatever my father sent me, I'm going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're hammering me, hammering me. I says, look, my father told me about a place 298. Again, I knew nothing about it. My father worked with Ronnie Sessa. Ronnie Sessa was a rescue floor guy. His son Ray Sessa started out in 298 as a fireman. Uh, worked up through the ranks. He was up in the Bronx. Ray was a great guy. Uh, awesome. And um, and again, I knew Ronnie. I played paddle ball with and the son also. But so I said, I think I'm going to a place called 298. And Teddy so now the order comes down, and Teddy's just looking at me and smiling at me. And he goes, I don't know what you think you know, but you're going to the fucking Bronx, 63 engine. So I'm like, okay. I don't give a shit. I'm out of here. That was the goal. Get off this fucking <laughs> I island. Yeah, I don't yeah, care yeah. where I go. So I come home, tell my dad, I says, I'm going to 63 engine. Well, out of every stupid thing I've ever done in my life, and I did a lot of childish things in my life that were fucking stupid. I never saw the roof come off my house when I told my father I'm going to 63. <laughs> he, he lost crazy. his mind. 
Really? Oh, goddamn. I did 20 fucking. I never asked for a goddamn thing. I asked for one thing and they fuck it up. You mother. And he's screaming. And I'm like, Dad, I don't care how bad. I don't, I'm just happy. I'm going. I'm out. No, no. You don't understand. Bye, bye, bye. He's screaming. He gets on the phone. And back then, you know, he had the phone in the kitchen. That was the only phone. Yeah, yeah. Screaming. <laughs> I don't know who he's screaming at, and he's screaming. And he, and again, my father very rarely lost it, and I did some stupid things in my life. <laughs> and he hangs up the phone. He goes, "You go up there, you shake everybody's hand, you do whatever they fucking want. You don't leave a stitch of closing in that car, in that firehouse. What? You leave your gear in the car? Blah 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 blah. blah, blah. Okay. I go up, drive up." Probation, any fire, fire, cracks, yeah, nice to meet you, blah, 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 guys are great, go across the street, I buy a couple of beers, blah, 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 I drive home. It's now 10 o'clock at night. At 11.30, phone rings. Captain of 63 engine. You know, probation, fire, fire, fire. Uh, it was a pleasure to meet you. Um, <laughs> Hoping you leave nothing here. Nice knowing you. Uh, yeah. you've, been, you've been transferred? I wish you the best of luck. Congratulations. I go, okay, where am I going? <laughs> he goes, you're going to 298 engine. I said, okay. So my father's argument had nothing to do with the Bronx. My father was in 60 engine for almost 10 years. He didn't want me to pay the toll. That was his argument. He says, you got to drive past 10 firehouses, then go over a bridge. And you know 20 ways to get to the bridge, but you still have to go over the bridge. You're not paying the fucking toll. I paid that toll. You're not paying. I was like, that, I don't care. But anyway, so that's the story behind that. So now I walk. Now it's even worse <clears throat> because I got six hours on a job and I got a department <laughs> order with my name on it and nothing else. <laughs> so I walk in. Right? Trans yes. Does it, does it so say transfer? I walk transfer into 298. From Hey, Cap, does it say transfer? And uh, Captain Moore, Vinnie Moore, I don't know if you know Vinnie Moore. Vinnie That's Moore, great. if he walked into a church, he can get two nuns to have a fist fight and he could walk out. That's how good of a shit star he was. I walk in, I go up to the office, probation, firefighter, Craig Slavino. Who the fuck are you? Probation, firefighter, Craig Slavino, <laughs> sir. Another fucking Southern European that I don't need in this fucking firehouse. <laughs> I'm like, probation, firefighter, Craig Slavino. Because <laughs> I got 25 years on this job. I'm a captain of New York City Fire Department. I've never had a department order with just my name on it. Who the fuck are you? <laughs> <laughs> Get the fuck down, sis. And that's how it, that's how I wound up in 298. And that's but that's the story. It had nothing to do. I saw somebody who mm -hmm. could only handle the Bronx for four hours. I thought that was hysterical because that was you know, Gene. Yeah, me and Gene. I was just doing what I was told, and I learned that's a really bit. <laughs> so that's how I wound up in 298, and that's how I was only in the Bronx for over four hours. But uh, it was hysterical. It was. I think uh, get to 298. Yes. It's 1987. How much work are they doing over there? They doing a lot of work. So yeah, they were doing good work. See, back then, um, there was no. It, they were only doing. They were doing three thousand runs, and the truck was doing 5,500. Uh -huh. Because there was no two nine uh, 133. Right. We still had all the pull boxes. So 298 was. You know, they were doing well. You know, it was us. We ran in with 303, 275, you know, the other way was 301. You know, we were second due to 275 quarters. Um, so, we, you know, they, they did good work. They did over 3,000 runs. They were always, you know, buying the numbers. You know, they, were, they weren't on, you know, they weren't the top 10, but they were there. And they were banging it in, in you know, with the 13th division. That was that little hole that Jamaica. It's a huge and then area. crack came. And when the crack year started, it was insane. But and then again, 298 was doing about 3,000 runs. There was no EMS. And the truck was going in and out like a honeymoon dick. They were, you know, they were doing over 5,000 runs because, again, we had pull boxes. Right. You know, and we were first, due, 127 was first due to 275 quarters. They so, had a huge area, 127. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huge yeah. area.
So the uh, other the question that you I was given a lot of the most 1075s in the city for a long time. Yes. Well, they, that was an unbelievable house. Um, a single engine class act. They, you know, they dropped two lines all the time. You know, they were on their own for long periods of time because it was the truck was coming from 127 or 126 yeah. or 165. Right. I think. Yeah. It was coming. So, I mean, they were on their own. You know, again, it was private dwellings, but they worked their balls off. And, you know, they had the highest death rate for the longest time. There was, uh, I don't know if you remember, Congressman Floyd Flake. Um, he was a very powerful guy, and he was one of the guys that really fought and fought and fought to get the truck opened up there because yeah. they had a lot of civilian deaths down there because they were, it was it was quick, you know. I think Cleehouse was there, wasn't he? Cleehouse started there. I worked with Cleehouse many at nights. You know, we did details. Um, and one of the classiest things that Cleehouse would do when the company was having a function, Cleehouse would not go to the function. He'd work. And he'd cook dinner for the details. Really? Yeah. And I, I, I got to work with Cleehouse when he was in 275 and when he was in 126. Um, just an unbelievable guy. I mean, you could, you, you know, you just suck whatever information you can get out of him. Yeah. Yeah. He was he was just one of the A team, and you know I I was very lucky in my career. I, I always had really good bosses around me, and the really bad bosses were so bad that we learned what not to do. Right, you know? <laughs> See, that guy don't do what he does. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, you know we were, we were very lucky. I was very lucky where I was because we had we had really good guys. Um, I was too short for the engine because back then. When I got there, everybody in 298 was over six foot, and everybody in 127 was under six foot. Really? We back with the company, it, we were laughed upon, and it was, but it was it was a tough house. It was a ball breaking house. I saw that uh, what's his name wrote that article about where Hairbag came from. <laughs> um, no. You didn't see that? No. You guys posted it. Um, we. Oh, where the the Buffalo, Hairbag the came from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you know yeah. where it came from? Go to the barber, right? Like if you had to. No, Lou, I can't hear you. I don't know if you're talking to me. Oh. Can you hear me, Coop? I can hear you. I can oh. hear you. No, but I can't hear Lou. Hmm. Try it. Just give a little one check. Testing one, two, three, four, five. Can you hear him now? Him? Nope. No. Really? Oh. You can hear me? I hear you. That's better. That's Probably crazy. Better off. <laughs> I can't hear what <laughs> Lou's saying. <coughs> oh, I just heard that. <laughs> okay. Okay, so whatever. So, I don't know what I was telling you. You were telling me where the hairband hair came from. I thought it came from the barber, where the guys were. Yeah, well, so they get a day off, so they would say they were getting a haircut. So eventually, they made them come back with a hairband. So the reason why I bring it up is, it took six months to me to learn why I was called whale shit. <laughs> whale shit. Whale you're, shit. Below, you're at the bottom of the ocean. Whale shit's at the bottom of the ocean. And what's lower than the bottom of the ocean? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> but, but it, took me, it was like after six months, I, uh, Harold McGee, I I, uh, I got to ask, why? I, I'm fine with whale shit, but, you know, why? And he says, Actually, well, I posted that picture now that you say that, Cap. I posted that picture now that you say that. It was a whale. Whale well, shit. Funny. All right. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it was. Uh, Who were the other I, offices at uh, 298 when you got there? So when I got there, it was Lynch. Who was a class act, and he, he he was a great fire officer. He taught a lot. He really, you know, he put effort into it. Um, he he was, he, but he only wanted one thing at roll call. He wanted the readings. Remember the readings? I don't know if you remember the oil this. from the oil and the, was uh, the oil, the house, and the gas. Yeah, because back then the chief's cars had gas, and um, that's all he wanted at roll call somebody to hand him a piece of paper with the readings. So I would always do it because that's all he wanted. And Not he was the great guy. Well, <coughs> apparently guys would go, fuck him, let him get his own readings. <laughs> yeah. And then he was miserable the whole fucking day. You know, and you're like, I don't get this. I mean, but anyway, Lynch aired, Tom aired, who on one of my third or fourth tours, I come home and I go, Dad, do you know a guy named Tom Ed? And my father goes, Acid Mouth Ed? 
how do you know him? I go, he's one of the lieutenants, 298. My father goes, oh, no. <laughs> so, so my roll call with Ed, the you know, you know, control, backup, whatever. And he goes, uh, your father on this job? Said, yes, sir. Al Silvino? Yes, sir. Me and you are going to have a lot of fun. <laughs> but he was great. He was great. He was uh, another guy. You know, th this was all, you know, this. This is all the show. Yeah. Um, and uh, Vinnie Moore was the captain. The show. I love and, that. Uh, all the show. It, was, it was awesome. Um, you know, I, you get your balls busted, you get hammered, you know, you know, you weren't allowed. They, they were, they were, I mean, Timmy Regan, I don't know if you remember, the, I know he was an asthmat guy. Yeah, Timmy Regan. Um, Jimmy Lang, uh, Mike Klimchek, um, Tommy Matus. These are my senior guys in 298. And I tell you, they, they were brutal, but they were great. They were great. Tony Vanacore. I don't know if anybody knew Tony Vanacore. The man was an athlete. The guy was guys busted his balls because he was the best at everything. But after every job, these guys, okay, we did this, we did this. You know why we did this? You understood why you did this? Whatever. So you know the, the ball busting is you know okay as long as you're learning. Right. And they were teaching, and I was a sponge. And uh, I, 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 like I said before, you know, some people you learn what to do. And some people, you learn what not to do, but you always make sure you learn something. And that was my goal. And uh, so after, you know, I, I loved in the engine. Uh, I had a How blast. How did you get to the truck after one year? That's what I want to know. So uh, that's, that's a, I'll tell you that story in a minute. But we, <laughs> I, went to the, I went to the truck because the house rule was you're on a mutual, you're on a back step. You got door control if you're on a mutual. I was single. I lived six miles from the firehouse. If you do your straight tours, you always got the nozzle. You got nozzle or backup. Correct. I never, I never worked my tours. Everybody was banging nails back then. Everybody was involved in something. Uh, you know, and I was six miles. I would get calls at 10 to 9. Can you come in? I got to go. No problem. And I'd be there. And I would work for everybody and i'd never work my tours so the captain of the truck danny alabrandi says to me are you interested in coming to the truck because we had they had a bunch of vacancies and he says yes i am and he says all right i'll get you over here on the next order i says all right but first i gotta talk to captain moore he says all right so i go up to moore and i says look uh, alabrandi asked me to come to the truck and i would really i'm gonna make the move he goes, oh, you're going over with the fucking guineas. You're going to the other side. <laughs> Forget about it. Right? Forget about it. Of course <laughs> we are. What are you talking about? Goes, okay. you know, but he says to me, he says, why? And I says, well, I'm never nozzle control uh, or backup. He says, I always work mutuals. And I'm not going to stop making mutuals to help out the brothers. And I'm definitely not going to change house policy. He says, I go across the floor, I got the can. I'll take the can from now until I die, right. you know. So uh, he he agreed, and I went across the floor. And when I went to the truck, that's when Jerry Dombrowski came to 127, who was probably one of the most amazing firemen I ever worked with. That's, he came as a boss. Yes, that, that was a single axle uh, towel ladder when I first got there, the bag of bolts. You know, I... You know, I I told you before. You know, I was I got involved in buying new towel ladders and um, for the job. And I'll never forget some guy from Ferrara. It's two ninety two eighty three got that one the first Ferrara after nine uh, eleven. And the guy from Ferrara says, "I got to ask you a question." I go, "What?" He says, "Why does the FDNY want on the compartments the latch?" The locking order. mechanism and the gutter. And I says, you really want to know why? He says, yeah. I says, well, when the latch breaks, we use the clip. When the clip breaks, we drill a hole in the gutter. We put a 10-penny nail in there to keep the part <laughs> clip. <laughs> and he looked at me like, are you kidding me? I'll give no, you a taste of the 
He ain't lying. Yeah. I was just saying, he ain't lying. He ain't lying. Well, I can't tell you how many times we got a job going and we're sitting there trying to pop the nail out of the car <laughs> to get into the compartment. And, you know, when I was in a truck, we didn't have a hearse tool. 126 had the hearse tool. 125 had the hearse tool because they were actually on the parkways. So we go to the rock with the for, for drill and we had to use the do you remember the the bumper the bumper jack yeah, the chain, yeah, yeah. and the two bladed hacksaw with <laughs> you know and cutting oil you know you know that hard drill while well, the other company comes up with a hostel and we're sitting there with the saw we're dripping oil and we're and How many it, times it, did you make a turn and the hearse tool went flying out the, the you know, the, the generator oh, went flying out the compartment, right? Because the nail wasn't there or some shit. Well, like uh, How many times did you almost kill somebody with the can coming out of that little <laughs> container? <laughs> <laughs> I almost, I almost ran over a fireman. I was driving the chief and we pull out of quarters and the old towel has the, the single axle ones, they, the, the handle. He puts his coat on. He must have popped the handle. The truck makes a right turn. He goes flying out of the oh fucking Oh, my road. God. No way. And I'm coming up with the chief's car, and I'm... <laughs> <laughs> and he, me and Chief Driscoll go like this. Like to see if he's <laughs> under the car. And he stood up, oh and we're like, yes. And he's done the truck. Well, let me win. So... The, the shit that used to fly off the towel out of you, know, oh you remember it was held on with spit and glue. I mean, because you oh never put your rig out of service back then, because you'd never get it back. And 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 the stairs, you know, if any of you guys ever got the opportunity to go to Red Square to get a, a spare, you had to test like five rigs before you found one that would work. It's it, true. it was insane. It was really insane back then when. You know, now you it's on the rig. shit on the rig when it came in. You wouldn't even put half the shit on there, right? No, you couldn't. Yeah. You couldn't. And how many bungee cords and, you know, <laughs> back then, the back of the towel ladder, the ladders were flat. And we were a big ladder company. We were not, we did use the tower a lot because of wires and it was a lot of private dwellings back then. And, um, and the ladders, again, were flat and, I remember. Do you remember the Chiefs car used to have that wobbler on the? It was the the light. white. Light. They used to call, they call them the light. Mars lights. They were called Mars lights, right? They kind of did that little thing. Yeah, right. It was just one. It was the front of the chauffeur, and it would get so. I'll never forget. We had this Chief Driscoll, who wanted to be first to truck, and he would run into the building. He was. He, he didn't trust anybody, and him and his aide, Fogarty, another nice guy, he he would run into the building. He, that's all he ever did. So anyway, we got a job on Hillside Avenue, maybe two blocks away from the firehouse. Uh, fire in the store, people coming out the windows. We pull out. Again, the ladders are flat, and he comes right behind the towel ladder. And what's the rule? You got, you, got, you know, we use the 20 straight all the time. I grab it. And I pull back, and it, again it's flat, and I hit the wobbler. And now, now I'm I'm not even looking. <laughs> and I knock the fucking thing right off the fucking rig. Take the ladder, go up, and pull people down. Whatever it goes over, I put like a half inch scratch from the front all the way to the windshield, and oh we get God. you know. And, and you know the I had the roof. It was Billy Frage. I'll never forget. I had the uh, roof, and he had Billy the old, Yeah. <laughs> he looks at me and he goes, "That's the chief car." I go, "I know, <clears throat> I know. He don't belong there." And I boom, boom, boom. I get it off. I run around the back, fires out, come back to quarters. You know, and and you know how talented fireman. And before we get back to quarters, the chauffeur, what's his name, uh, Fogarty. His pitch is in the toilet bowl. They already <laughs> widened out and changed everything to read about how to stay 20 feet behind the towel ladder. And all that. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody ever said a word to me. It was just over with. 
And yeah, you, you, you were right about short guys, Billy Frage over in yeah. the uh, truck. Uh, oh yeah, no, we were all we were all this big. And then yeah, father of crime, rest his soul, Jimmy O'Shea. Um, you know, he was the big guy. You know, everybody else. I we he went to rescue four, Billy Fraze, right? Yeah. Yes, he yeah. did. Yeah. yeah. Him, he, and him, him, he went. A lot of a lot of guys from our house. He was just as short as he was wide, Billy. <laughs> so, tank, okay, right? so, so, do you know Billy Frazier's uh, badge number? No. Well, I can tell you because he was going to kill me. Because the old towel, you remember, you used to stick your helmet on the, on the engine compartment. Yeah. yeah I'm direct the there, whatever it was. Yeah. On the dog. Yeah, I, got, I got the irons. He's got the OV or whatever. We're sitting across from each other, and I look, and his, I see his badge. And I goes, Is that your measurements? <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, What? I go, The measurements. Those are, he goes, What the fuck are you talking about? I says, Your badge number is 5755. Five, five. I says, You're 5755. Five, five. <laughs> <laughs> five, seven, you're being generous, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wasn't going to change the number on his helmet. But I, had to get, you know, I had to go with it. I had to go with it. You know, but uh, he was. Yeah. yeah. But, so I, I, that's the reason why I went to the truck. And and I loved every minute. But I mean, I had great bosses. Uh, uh, you know, first of all, I was put. Jerry Dombrowski gets there. Well, all right. So here's, here's the stupidity of the, the FDNY. But of course, we were having fun. There's Marmon on the end. You guys know Dave. Oh, Marmon, yeah. Look man. at that. Yeah, uh, he was our probie. Anyway, we get a uh, car fire. The engine's out somewhere. So we pull up with the truck, and the car's burning. And what are we doing? Danny Willis is the boss there. I don't know if you guys know Danny Willis. We got Willis. a length on the back of the rig somewhere. Right. We got a, we got an inch and three quarter. We're all studying. Let's give it a shot. So we hook up the inch and three quarter, and we try to put out this car fire. And, of course, it's a 50-foot length, and the car is 56 feet away. <laughs> <laughs> and, and now Gary Stowe, you can see him with the irons, has the idea that, okay, maybe if I stick the axe in the end of the nozzle, we can get a better stream. Like a garden so, hose. <laughs> yeah, so basically we got <laughs> some over the garden hose. <laughs> we basically just soaked the crap out of us, and the car kept on burning. And the engine came around the corner and, and was like, are you, you know, stick what with the fucking break the windows. What are you <laughs> yeah, doing? Right. So that was a great photo. That was a funny day. That, again, Danny Willis, he was an engine boss, but a, a, another a unbelievable guy. That guy amazed me. He would walk in the door at four o'clock, walk over to the writing list, erase the day writing list and write the night writing list and then go upstairs. <laughs> so it's not even over. Well, yeah, it's four o'clock. You don't know who's coming in. <laughs> no. But he, he knew. He knew he what he had. He would and then go upstairs. But he was such another another awesome guy. But I got to work with Dennis Mohica, who another uh, guy. He's in 127. Yes, Dennis Mohica was in 127 before he went to rescue one. Um Dennis Ash. Uh, I I I mean I uh, unbelievable bosses that and then i don't know if you knew jerry dembrowski one of your podcasts somebody told the story of him he was in the name, yeah. yeah he was in 227 he was in the ton of mundo fire he was crushed he basically almost lost his arm he basically rebuilt himself and came back oh, yeah, to work I remember that. I remember that story. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. so that he was and jerry was 100 pounds soaking wet you know maybe five seven five five an unbelievable fireman, unbelievable fireman. And my answer was, this little shit ain't going anywhere that I'm not going. And he took me places and buildings that uh, I learned. I learned and I learned quick. And uh, we, we had a job. I was, we had a fully involved private well and every, we're pulling up and we think we're gonna, just going to drown it. We're not, we're not going to win this one. And he goes, let's go. Okay, you're going, I'm going. And we go up, we get up the second floor, we find two women, and now we're burning. And he and he's looking at me, and he says, just grab her and fall down the stairs. And, and we that's basically what we did. And we both we both rolled down the stairs with these two women. We got them out. Um, and, you know, the guys are coming over to me. Are you all right? I go, I don't know what the fuck just happened. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the fuck just happened. 
I did whatever I did. I did because that little shit told me to do it. But and it worked. He, it worked, and he he was just a. I mean, he again, just an amazing fireman. He he was just a great boss, and you know, but again, he was old school. He had the cheetah allegedly, you know. And then towards the end of his career, you know, to, uh, him being in 127, you know, I'm carrying him out. I'm, I, I got like. A fucking blind lady because everything's his eyes are burnt as he can't see because he was using his, the scuba I'm like what, what are you doing to yourself no no i'm a better i'm a better fireman okay so so he be, he gets promoted to captain and he goes to, to 175 i don't know if you guys ever heard this story he he gets the order comes down he's going to 175 so he gets boxed but now he goes to 175 and he's banging on the door it's like you know who is it Jerry oh, okay, sir. You know, okay, why don't you go? I'm your new captain. Yeah, I know. You're the new captain. Have a good day. I'm your captain. Yes, sir. Have a nice day. Go away. Go away. So, but, uh, he wound up being captain 175. Every time. We go out to dinner like every couple of months. He was just, again, I, I was very lucky. I had okay. some. Awesome. Him on the show, too. Jerry would be an awesome guy. Hey, Ralphie. Ah, there's Ralphie. There's Ralphie. We would one of the things I learned, you know, and that was, you know, I I didn't come up with half the shit on my own. I stole from everybody. And one of the firehouses that I worked in, the bosses used to go out to dinner. So I grabbed Captain Fenty, um, the guy all the way on the right. I says, let's take the bosses out for dinner. All right. And that's that's uh, Mark Schweigard, um, Ralphie, Longo, um, I'm trying to uh, rusty. Ralphie uh, steals all my shit my, too. Yes, yeah, Ralphie's a poacher. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're talking about poaching. You know, that's what the best part of the fax machine getting in a job because now I was able to cap uh, copy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, cool. walked, I walked out of half of Vigiano's office one door because I worked. In 176, and I'm just copying every piece of paper he had. It was like Mission Impossible. I had like a little, you know. yeah, and a little briefcase yeah. with you, right? Yeah, yeah. with, a, with a, a cufflet, a chain link on you, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'll read it later. I just got to get a copy of it. Yeah. I don't even know what it is, but it's coming from yeah. the fridge. It's got to be good. Well, it has to be good, right? You know, and I, if I worked in the engine, you'd go, Come with me, lad. Okay, sir. And I would go, you know. You know, I got a bottle. You know, I pressed the test, but you know, all this, I don't even list. know what it said. I'm just copying yeah. it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this is from his wife. Uh, pick him up, stick up butter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's freaking awesome. But, but, you know, that's but that's how you learn. That's how you got better. That's how yeah. you know you, you you took the good ideas. You you dumped that's the bad no ideas. We say it all the time, yeah. Cap. Yeah. You, you're part of all of the guys that you you enjoyed and you watched and you. Took all yeah. the good stuff. That's who you become. Yeah. Well, the, you know, how many guys know about the uniform filing system anymore? Yeah. But not, not me. <laughs> no, wait, wait, wait. What? <laughs> what? So that was the Dewey Decimal System. I, I heard you oh, mention yeah. that to your kids. But that was the Dewey <laughs> Decimal System in the fire department. Because, you know, when I got promoted, you know, they would tell you nothing has not happened before. You just got to find the report. Correct. And that was the uniform, uniform filing, filing system. Yes. 2.3.5.17, yes. right? <laughs> what was it? That every good lieutenant, or you know, yeah, oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. but but you know, that's you know, yeah, how much shit did you copy off of guys from the desk? You know, because they had great ideas. I mean, all the stuff that that I buried in my brain so that when I became captain, I was able to put out. It hey, wasn't let's me. Get you captain. We didn't make the lieutenant yet. We just get to lieutenant. Let's get let's get to the lieutenant because we're about okay. So I get promoted. So John Clancy gets killed um, right before I get promoted. Uh, about three, four months before, um, and that was that was tough. I actually ran that funeral. That was before we had a ceremonial unit, um, and I never forget getting the, call, the phone call from uh, McCarthy and uh, uh, what's his name. Shit. Anyway, you know, you the phone rings at nine o'clock, and the first thing you're saying to yourself is, "Was I supposed to work today?" <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. And but they tell me what happened. So, and I don't. I to this day, I don't know why I did it. 
And I go, well, all right, I'm on my way in. And I stopped and I bought a case of cups and like 30 pounds of coffee. And I said, we're going to need coffee. I don't know why I did it, but I was like, we're going to need coffee. And I went in there and we're everybody's in the firehouse. We're going over the whole thing. And, and um, now we start talking about back, back in those days, the firehouse ran everything. The funeral. They, I mean, if you, I don't know if you, you didn't study back then, but you, if you had a line of duty death in your firehouse, that the, the the telephone company would come in and put, you know, ten phone lines in, so that you can make calls and do all this stuff, and you basically ran the whole funeral. The ceremony unit back then only took care of the case on. That's all they took care of. The whole job was on you, and I knew Sacramento, and he from the rock so i says all right i'll take care of the case on and, and the actual day of the funeral and i'll never forget i drive out to uh, oakdale and um this i don't know what their high-ranking police officers in suffolk county you know he had birds and whatever he grabs me and he schooled me he taught me everything he 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 assigned two patrolmen to me they're yours, whatever you need. They'll take you anywhere. They'll take care of everything. I'm, I, I'm, I'm just like, huh? And he's, and one of the words of advice that he told me was, you're going to plan this funeral. And the mayor is supposed to give a speech and go off to the left. And he's going to go off to the right. You're the only one that knows that it's a mistake. So don't worry about it. And I, to me, that was like just great advice that we're going to plan it. Once we kick it off, game on, whatever happens, happens. Nobody knows what's supposed to happen. But here's another time I almost got fired. So I'm, I'm running a funeral. One of the things that I always hated in, in the funeral was your wife didn't sit with you. If you were the, you know, if it was your company, if somebody died in your house, you went in, everybody went in, you know how we load the church, and the, the wives of the firehouse were pushed to the side. So I had set up, the wives were going to be on the left side of the church. When we walked in, we would grab our wife and go sit down. This was under Von Essen, who I'm not a fan of, and I'll just leave it at that. Um, he, his XO, I don't remember his name. He had to be about 6'8", 280 pounds. And he comes over to, to the bus and he goes, okay, we want all the firemen to go in here and all the wives there. And I go, excuse me, sir, um, that's not the plan. And, and there was a battalion chief on, on with him. And I don't know if you remember back in the day, if we had a line duty funeral, they, again, there was no ceremony. You were detailed for the day. You come in in the morning. You got your uniform? Yeah, okay, you're going to do the detail. To the, and you showed up at the funeral because you were in uniform, and you ran it. You, it was just dropped in your lap, which was insane, but that's how they did it. That was their way. And I knew I couldn't win on the bus. So I said, Chief, can I talk to you outside? He says, yes. I says, look, I've been here for five days. This is the plan. He goes, well, you got to get it approved by the commissioner's office. So I go over to the commissioner's office, that guy that was like 6'8", and I go, this is what we're doing. He goes, who the fuck are you? He says, uh, I'm Feynman Silvino. I've been working on this facility. But he goes to me, this is not your funeral. This is not Clancy's funeral. This is the commissioner's funeral. Well, I go into full guinea mode. I mean, the hands, the hands are going, you motherfucker. You're, and you know when you've got words coming out of your mouth and you want to grab them? Because, <laughs> oh, shit. Lou knows that, bro. Yeah. I was going to yeah. say, I've never done that before. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going to myself, I'm going to get promoted. And as I'm screaming, this is what's going on in my stupid brain. I'm getting promoted in like three months. I, I'm, I might as well get my easy pass. I'm going to Staten Island. I mean, and I'm screaming, you know, and I'll never forget Richie Sierra, who was a commissioner, um, and another guy, uh, God, another great guy. They come running down the street. And they're, Craig, what's the matter? What's the matter? I go, this motherfucker. They push me to the side. Sacramento grabs me. He says, calm down. And the commissioner, Shearer, tells him, we're doing it to what he said. That's it. And I was like, so I get back on a bus. Vinnie Moore, my captain, looks at me and goes, 
you got some fucking set of balls. <laughs> How are you walking through the, the, the yeah. fucking bus doors with them balls, baby? Oh, God, yeah, no, I was listen. <laughs> I was sitting out the back. I was not. It was. It was done. But it, again, I, I my whole career, I believed in what was right and wrong. My father taught me right and wrong. He didn't teach me left and right. He taught me right and wrong. And he, he always told me, if you're right, it's game on. And 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 I kind of stuck with it. And I've made a. You know, I know I've said some things I probably shouldn't have said, but out of respect and and I guess people believing in what I'm what I do it gets it gets washed so anyway so i get promoted that's where we were heading i get promoted and um i go to the 15th i get assigned to the 4-4 mm. i meet ratso who says to me uh you know we'll take care of you whatever you want and he opens his bottom drawer mm. i'm a dopey kid from queens i don't know what that means and he goes yeah if you want to work here want to work here you know and he looks at the bottom drawer and I'm like, I'm getting okay. They'll let me know. And I'm bouncing around and I'm walking. I walk out and I forgot it. Just, he kept on opening his bottom drawer. I don't know. What, he said, You're supposed to put a bottle in there. I go, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> why didn't you say so? I mean, why do we got to play this game? You know, no, you can't have this game here. Tell me what you're ah. <laughs> Anyway, I get a, the division. And again, I was, I was, uh, I was married. We had no kids. My wife was working. I didn't care about 24s. I didn't care about any of that. Um, and they offered me the 4-4-R four, four group. That's and nice. That but the 4-4-R four, four, group was 231, 120, and 283. And then you had three open groups. But the wow. division, yeah, but the division would fill those groups with me first. They said, if you're in an R group, you get the spot. So I worked in some unbelievable houses. I, I learned so much shit from places I worked. And it, it was awesome to me because, again, I had no responsibilities at home. My wife was working ridiculous hours. Um, we didn't have any of uh, my daughter yet. I would I would be available at the beginning of the, the two day tours and I was and at the end of the two tours. So I would bank the day tours and I'd work the, the overtime on the night tours. So I always had a lot of you know extra tours off and on so I was able to move around. And they always put me in great spots because I was in that R group. And and every once in a while, he said, "You want to get out of there?" Nope, I'm good. I'm good. And it uh, it was unbelievable. I mean, uh, 283, 231, 120. You can't ask for a better R group. And then I would work in 111, 176. You know, uh, the big hit of houses. And, and you got to remember, I got promoted with about nine years. You know, uh, back then that was young. Yeah. You know, now guys getting promoted before they get out of probate school, but. I, I was uh, I was a young guy from Queens, you know, and I uh, I didn't come in with an attitude. I came with, okay, teach me something, you know, and and they did, and uh, you know, there were some places that you know they they test you, and I would stand up. I said, okay, listen, I don't give a shit because my father told me he says you're gonna get promoted. When you get promoted, don't ever give an ultimatum unless you're gonna go through with it, because if you don't, you either have to transfer. I'll never respect you. Or retire. He goes, oh, that's your choice. So before you open your fucking mouth, and he knew, you know, you know that if you're going to throw an ultimatum out there, you better be ready. And I, I, I took that to heart, and I knew. But I, you know, the, the, you, the bad times that I had on this job, I can count on one hand, you know, where I actually had to be a boss. The other times, so it was, it was awesome. I, I learned from people. Uh, you know, I, 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 they were gods. They were, they were great to me. I was very lucky. Um, and I, I took whatever they taught me and I just kept on pushing it, you know, and then that's the whole idea of this job, right? Is to pay it forward. Cap, yeah. Those times when you were getting promoted that you had, you were going in houses that were, like you said, heavy hitting houses, but they had a lot of senior men. Mm -hmm. so it was like the place almost ran themselves, right? You, you were really just along for the ride for the most part. I mean, uh, they, yep. you were the boss. Oh, yeah, right. I had the Sarge driving me when, when I was in uh, 123. I mean, uh, I worked with, uh, you know, you had him on Richardson. I would work with. All um, oh, right. He was there. Wild, I mean, guy. Think about 111, how many guys, the senior guys they had over there. 120, oh. how many senior guys? I mean, it's incredible. I loved working at 120. And I, I tell you, laughing, 
Mike Laffin. He was the funniest fucking guy in the world. And I, I thank God every day when I walked into that kitchen that I was a lieutenant. So he was only going to smack me. He wasn't going to bury me. <laughs> <laughs> I walk in and he, you know, I take my he throw two shots at me and I okay, and then he'd move on, you know. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> As you being a pro, be there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, forget that. Oh, and, um, uh, that was, but that was a again. I and again, I, the Chiefs. I had Iavolo, uh in the engine. I had Iavino. Um, I, you know, I have all, uh, I'm sorry. I have, you know, was the Lieutenant, um, the captain who did 20 years as the captain of two thirty one. Um, he had two wow. kids on the job. I can't remember his name. But I'm sure somebody will throw it up for you. Um, nicest guy in the world, but they taught me, you know, they would, they, they would just throw it out there. And if you listened, you were great. I mean, I, I somebody Not Higgins. Um, they talk about Higgins. No. Uh, though Higgins, Higgins, was I was in 283 because when I was in 283 and when I was covering, it was Charlie Williams was the captain. And that there is no better. I mean, that's the captain's captain. That man was squared away. Rescue two guy. I mean, he, he was what they tell you in probably, you know, in the uh, flips, uh, the boss where they say, you know, uh, you know, you as a captain, you got to be a priest, you got to be a psychiatrist, you got to be this guy. But that was Charlie Williams. Charlie Williams was amazing. Yeah. Oh, he was he was just a class act. Um, so I again, I learned from him, and then and then it was me, Sano, Gary Benedict. I mean, we had a blast. Um, they had three lieutenants that basically would compete with each other. You know, we would work, we would try to outdo each other because. You know, we were trying to see who was more squared away. And Sana was unbelievable. And Gary used to fuck with Sana, so it was fun. But, uh, it, you know, I, I, as you said, I had some crazy f jobs uh, bouncing around. I had one job with, uh, I learned the Sterling Street Fire. I was saying it to you before. It was a big video. They were using it for training a lot. Um, it was a vacant. It was about a four-story old law tenement stood by itself. It's you know two floors of fire, but it was set back. You had to go up like three steps, then go back, and then get to the building. And um, it was back when 280 was piggybacked with 249, I think it was. I think it was in – oh, no, I was in 234. We're like third due engine. We pull up. There's nobody there. This place is wrong. There's no other company. I, I, I turn back to the guys. I go, we got it. Let's go. We stretch the line. Just – that guys from 280 are there. You know, it's our first two jobs. Okay, it's three fours of five. You, you, whatever you want, I'll go above you. you know, they go in, we go in behind them. Another line comes in, and we're taking a beating. And we get up to the top of the stairs. I, I, you know, um, we take the door off. We go in, and all of a sudden, everybody loses water. So put the door back up on the hinge and tell the guys, all right, look, we got to go. We got to go. We're going out the window right here. Oh, we're rolling down the stairs. Okay. Okay. We got to go. We're calling for water. You know, you call for water once. I learned that as a long time ago. It's not like your chauffeur is not trying to give you water. So you call for water once after that, you don't want to hear it. He knows what he's going to do. You don't want to hear it. You better yeah. start moving towards the window. <laughs> This place is getting bad. It's getting bad. And now Mike Cerulli, Mike Cerulli from 280. There was a ladder up to the second floor. There's a dry line in. Coming in. I see him coming in the window. And the place lights up. I dive on the top of him. I'm on top of him. With that, we get water. I get burnt, Mike gets burnt, knock it down, the fire goes out, everybody's happy. So I go downstairs, and you mentioned his name, and I always forget it. He was a chauffeur in 235. Fisher? Fischler? <laughs> it's just, Frank was just asking about him. Yeah, he was. Jay so what, he, what was that? Jay Fischler? No, Jay Fischler was a captain. No, he was a fireman. He was a seated chauffeur. I wish I knew. Again, I, I'm losing it, but 
he pulled the move that I added to drills from that day on. And basically what he did was he had, you know, checked the hydrant, hooked up, getting water. Now he lo- he's got three lines coming off him. Everybody's playing the game, and now everything shuts down. But he looks at his Coniglio. That was the guy's name from 231. Anyway, he looks at the rig. He looks at the hydrant. He sees water spitting out of the hydrant, and he sees the spray at the intake. But he's got nothing in the pumps. So he knows the blockage is between the hydrant. And into the hydrant and into the pumps. Oh. Well, he bypasses it. He takes the two and a half, throws it off the side of the rig, shuts the hydrant down, opens up the two and a half on the hydrant, hooks into the two and a half, cranks it open, gets it into the inlet with the two and a half, and we all get water. He basically saved four guys' lives. Wow. Because he didn't try to clear the blockage. He didn't take try to take off, right? Take the whole he, thing didn't, he, he knew he had a water source. It just wasn't getting into his rig. Right. He just, he, re, he redid it. it was probably he went to plan B. He went to plan. I don't know what plan that was, but it, it, it was C-D-D. fucking awesome. and, it, and And that's when that whole, uh, first of all, that's when they say, okay, no more than two lines off the rig and all that nonsense. And, but that's where it came down about putting the fucking why on the hydrant immediately mm. with the shut off there right now you got a shut off on the other side because you know so you know it, it wasn't me so now i go give this drill at another firehouse because i'm in the yard group and they're looking at me oh, oh you're a genius so I'm, 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 <laughs> <laughs> wow. I'm a i'm a thief I would always admit it. I was always give credit. So, you know, that was my, I was a fair a guy that way. But, you know, these, these are things that, you know, you, the guys, I always say that if we'd only use our, our brain for good, the fire department would run the world. You know, we're, the, the we're like 97 percent. I was just going to say we were. <laughs> <laughs> Majority. You got like a, a three, four percent uh, leeway there, right? Yeah, there, yeah. You know? If you keep the alcohol away, we can rule the world. <laughs> <laughs> and the boredom. I think yeah, it's the boredom. The boredom. That really, uh... Well, boredom is what causes trouble. Yeah, yeah no doubt about that. Yeah, when, how many fire? We were talking about the. You were talking about another interview. How many firehouses have been burnt down by mistake? Oh, <clears throat> Rescue yeah. one quarters. Yeah. Uh, hey, Cap, I wanted to talk about. Puffy. I want to talk about. Uh, one of the other fires you were at two thirty one uh, at uh, you were in two thirty one yeah. at the Atlantic Avenue fire and yeah. uh, two eighty three at the Vendalia Avenue fire. So, so again, I gotta tell you, Atlantic Avenue um, was an eye opener. Um, it was so insane. You first two there. No, he was second though. Second two. We pulled in with two with three thirty two. Um, One twenty was out of service, um, and you know the. I'll, I'll tell you the story of fire, and I'll tell you what I took away from it, and I learned, and I I, I kept uh, from that. But anyway, it was change of tours. You know, I show up at five, I relieve whoever it was. Now you're in and out of the firehouse. You know, we're finally back in the firehouse at seven o'clock. I got you know a pocket full of runs. I got two riding lists. I got whatever. Be boob. We go one twenties out of service. We go and. We pull up and this place is roaring. And 332, Blackmore, um, they go to force their way in and we stretch a line. And I, I'm like, okay, you know, we're gonna, you know, we're going to try to get in another way. And I had Dominic, um, I wrote it down. So Michelle from 120 was riding with us because they were out of service. And he's look, so we fuck, pop the door and it goes straight up the stairs. And 332 gray officer Blackmore grabs me. He says, uh, we, that's not the fire. You, you got the fire. We're first. So we switch. <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't, you know, I, I always found it amazing in Brooklyn on how we fight over, you know, miles of fire. I, whatever you want, I'll, I'll do, I'll take you. I'm back you up, you know. But anyway, so he goes that way. I go to he says, no, no, I was right. I said, okay, switch again. 
Well, Danny Wetzel had, I think, had the nozzle. Um, he did have the nozzle. I came on with Wetzel. Yeah, we go in, and we had they had, we they started punching a hole under the stairs to get to the fire building. Um, because it was all attached, you know, and Danny goes in the hole. I go in, and all of a sudden, we light up, and we get blown. I mean, it was like, and that's probably when the collapse occurred. Um, so we get bounced out. Guys are screaming. They're telling me, okay, you got it's It's in here. It's here. You got to back them up. And Galvin had the job um, and Kill Duff um, was the, was drive. That, that's why we have that video of the job because he had a buff with him. Yeah, had the, uh, Warren talked about that. Yeah. And I'll tell you, yeah, that that's how scary. It, that video is scary looking when that's ripping like that, man. That's a scary fire. Looking that like was, that. It's already, you know, we've already attacked this thing twice already by the time the video comes, because they were the all hands chief or the additional chief or whatever. They weren't the original. So now we, you know, we're fighting our way in and we get told there's a collapse, but our line is there's a, there's a ladder in the loop of our line. So now we're trying to get in and we're fighting, fighting. I finally go back out. I find that, pull it out. We're going in, we're going in. And it's, it's, I mean, it was ridiculous. And all of a sudden we see stripes and I'm going to tell you, I've never, my heart never, I, I, I basically was like, okay, game on now. I see the stripes of a fireman and he's in the pile. And we, you know, we, 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 we handed the nozzle to the detail. And he says, you just keep this over our heads. And we go over and we find Blackmore. Um, but he's, he's burnt up. I mean, he's bad. And that's when it was basically, he's, he's gone. There's other guys in here. And all of a sudden, wow. I think we, somebody hears a moaning and we're like, Oh fuck, he's not. So we go back and we grab him and we get him out. And we know that Timmy's in there. The other guys are in there. What was amazing to me was as we're fighting this fire, we're going in, there's no smoke. I mean, we took our mask off. There was no smoke. And we're, we're looking for everybody. We find the other firefighters who are, who are in trouble. And we start working, trying to dig them out. Who's digging them out? Joe Wydell almost ripped. What's his name in half? I don't know if anybody knows Joe Wydell. He's a big, a big dude. Guy. Big fuck. I mean, he goes he, to Proby School with him. He's a big guy. What nicest guy in the world. He has like a baseball mix. <laughs> and he was a... He was a plumber, and he would, with a little screw like this, you're like, there's no way you're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> sausage fingers. Get the yeah, sausage, sausage fingers out fingers, here. Bro. Yeah. And he, he was the greatest cook. You know, we're, we're a single engine, and he's cooking for 40 guys. Yeah. We would put more food in the refrigerator after we ate than what we actually ate when he cooked. But anyway, another awesome guy. But anyway, now... We know what's going on. Now we know guys, whatever we get. Um, I'm trying to remember who we took out. Baker? The kid Baker? No, Quinn. Quinn. Right, Quinn? We grab Quinn. We come out. We, we're getting him out. And it was the most amazing thing to see. Riggs, firemen. Hose all over the front of the front. But I come out and I'm like, where do I go with him? You know, I, we were, there was no, I mean, you had a guy, a fireman, and, you know, there's five of us holding him. And what, what, you know, this, on television, the stretcher is always right there. Yeah. You know, and we take off, we go. So, you know, if you're looking at the building, we go to the left, we're heading down. And I'll never forget, I look up and I'm on the radio. I'm trying to tell people, listen, I got a burnt fireman. We're trying to, whatever. Um, we actually, I don't know what rig it was. We grabbed a can and we're now soaking Quinn down oh, because he's still all fucked up. And I look up at the street and there's no street signs. 
and I don't know Brooklyn at all. You know, Queens, everybody hates Queens, but it was always 145, 146, 147, 148. You know, it, you know, name streets. I don't fucking know. There's no streets. I, I, I can't tell. I'll never forget. Battalion chief comes down the street and we strip his car in the middle of the street and we throw him and off he goes to the hospital. Okay, we go back in and it, it was just, it was so unreal. Because you're in a burning building, but you can see because it's you're at, it's basically you're at a fireplace because there's no everything's leaving everything's gone and you had to collapse already. So now it's over. You know, everybody's you know we're all done, and you, you can't you know you can't imagine what's going on, and then. You know, we get back to quarters and Chief Gancy at the time, who I knew, but it comes up to me and now is asking me questions. And you're like, I got no clue. I got, I don't know. Well, I helped. I, I took out so-and-so. I took out so-and-so. Yeah, you were to the left of me. That was you? You know, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Just a blur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just you're, doing what you have to do. You're in that mode. You know, that's why I, I when I taught at The Rock, one of the big things I used to tell people is nobody rises to the occasion. You fall back on your training. You you know, you're not lifting the car. You, it's stop already. It's once you go into that mode, you're just operating. And you're going and you better have a really good Rolodex because if you don't, you're going to be sitting in the corner crying. You better have and, a really good Rolodex. I like yeah. that. Rolodex. We talked about that. What's that? What's no, that? I'm sorry. How about file cabinet? <laughs> <laughs> but can you go with file cabinet? No, I, like, I like that. But, you know, I, I used to tell guys, you know, you, you, you're not going to learn the PSX on the window. You know, you better have it like that. Because if you don't, you're not figuring it out on game day. And I learned that on Atlantic Avenue that I was not, I mean, I was going, we were doing, we, we, we were doing good stuff, but we, you know, it, it's a blur. And then when I get, we get to see the video and the freakiest thing about that video was that it was almost an hour long. And I could swear on a Bible. Five minutes, right. And that was a 10 minute fire and we were in there for 50 something minutes wow. and that's that's how i became friends with warren fuchs because i didn't know warren fuchs you know i was probably one of the only guys in a job who didn't know who dispatcher 120 was and i wrote him a letter basically saying i don't know who you are um you all, you know, when a when an aircraft carrier is out at sea and a plane is damaged and the guy in the in the tower talks the pilot onto the aircraft carrier and he saves his life. Everybody on the deck runs over to the pilot and congratulates him. And the guy in the tower brings down the next plane and the plane and he just goes back. To his He's doing his business, yeah, 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 no doubt. Because when you listen to the tape, I mean, Warren's giving directions. He's doing fire reports. He's telling chiefs this. He's doing this, this and he's just going. And he is just—he's he, the tower. Mm -hmm. And I it's still one of my favorite shows. Cap was when that. Warren came on the show. When he was on the show, oh, that's still I one of watch. my favorite shows. Mm -hmm. Oh my god! Yeah, he. It was a man. It was, and it was like six months later. I'm working. I don't know, three twenty-three, and he bangs on the door. And he goes, Lieutenant Silvino. I says, Yeah. And he goes, I'm dispatcher one twenty, and we hug, <laughs> and, we were, and we were best friends ever after that. Wow. But that's what it was, because to me, that guy on the radio. So that's my tool. Dixie Dugan got it back for me. He was the chief of safety at the time. That's that was my tool in Atlantic Avenue. They dug wow. it out. And they, I mean, it's, I was like, you know, well, you know, so much in my career came out of that fire.
because when I sat back and ran it through my brain on everything I did wrong or everything I could have done better. And, you know, starting with the writing list, starting with, you know, not having a writing list done, not being prepared at the change of tours. The other thing, you know, I, I, I tell my guys when we were fast truck, you know, everybody out fast truck, blah, 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 but I would take the OV and the roof. I, their job in 127 was to go to the building, find the doors, the rear door, the side door, and turn around. And when you turn around, you're going to build me a runway to the ambulance. I want the fence gone. I want this gone. I want that moved. And then when some, if God forbid, one of the brothers finds another brother and they pull him out, we're going to say, follow me. And I'm going to get you over the hose lanes. I'm going to get you through the fence and I'm going to get you into that ambulance and on your way. And it was, that was one of my big things. If you're the roof of OV and you're the uh, fast truck, you go right to the building, to the side door, left door, whatever way, whatever building it is. You, what's the secondary means of egress? And you turn around. Fuck the building. Turn around. And I want a runway to where, wherever the ambulance is. That was a, yeah. that was a good thing. That's always um, funny because when I was in 103, I always felt like when we were in a fast truck. Mm -hmm. Oh, even as a squad, when I when I used to see the fast truck, and, and again, it's it's a crappy spot, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you're waiting while everybody else is working, and you get stuck there, and it's kind of like you can get lulled a little bit because 99.9% mm -hmm. .9 of the time, nothing ever happens. Thank God, right? right. Yes. But I always felt if I like exactly what you're saying, like you still have to be prepared for the worst case scenario. In the end, you're you're supposed to be that guy, that guy, right? Yeah. So. You know, I used to say, I used to have my two guys go around the back just to see what was going on. Give me eyes, come back, you know, not go in the building, right. but come back, let me know what's going on. Mm -hmm. Because I always felt that that was a little laxed. I used to see, you know, guys drag the stokes up and I always felt like they weren't prepared 1000% because it is a shit spot. You know what I mean? Like you're not getting part of the job for the most part, right? No. Well, again, we talk about people I learned from. Chief Galliotto was in the 5 0 when I was a fireman. And this was back in the day when the deputy only came on a, a second alarm doubtful. You're the battalion chief. You got it. You're on your own. Excuse me. And before, I don't know if anybody remembers, we had the fat engine. That yes, engine the fast truck. Then, we got, then we had the fast truck. But the fat engine was an engine that was supposed to be what the fast truck became. And Galeotto would always have an engine and truck next to him at all times and in queens it, it, it meant a lot because we were so far away from each other so if you had a problem and you called for additional engine truck or additional alarm, 15 minutes yeah, <laughs> more yeah, than that so he again back in the late 80s he had an engine and truck next to him doing nothing at all times just for that reason and i learned from that because he would say the, the reflex time was too much yeah you know in, in brooklyn you would you're right on top of each other you know you, you call for somebody there there you know in queens you know and forget about rockaway yeah you know you're on your own right. so you know I, again you, you these are things you learn you know and, and that's how you get better you know because you, you admit that you didn't do it right and you try to figure out and the other big thing that i i, I always worked on was how did we get here? You know, because, okay, we had our mistake, we had a problem, but what happened before that that got us to the mistake? Because if I can eliminate that, then I don't have to worry about the mistake coming. Hmm. You know, if I can get, if I can stop having the problem, then I don't have to worry about these problems. And I, I don't know where I learned that. And, and, and that was another thing I always stuck. And I used to always say, okay, how do we get here? And that's how I ran my drills. Whenever I, when I would taught, I would eliminate how guys, because you know, when you went to the rock, well, when I was a fireman, you went to the rock at three o'clock, there was nothing but wild turkeys on the rock. There was nothing going on. It was, it was, it was, it was, you know, and, and it was like wild mean, turkeys? I'm going to shoot them. Yeah. No, I'm serious. I'm serious. You know? And anyway, so, the guys who made it better 
through the years that when I got there, I got there because there was a problem and I was brought there to clean it. But when, when I got there, I realized that I have work to do. And if I'm going to create a drill. I'm going to make sure you can't fuck it up. And you know what I mean by fuck it up, because you can give the greatest drill, but if you make a mistake performing this drill, meaning the instructor, Hey, fucking guys at the rock. I don't know what yeah, yeah, no oh, doubt. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, half no, you can't you. do anything half ass. No. So, and I don't want to waste your time. Because you drive to the rock, I'm going to give you a good drill, and you're going to go home happy. And if you do that, then I've changed the mind thought. And I worked for a guy, Thomas Galvin. I worked for um, Garrity, who was unbelievable. Um they would let me go free reign. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. And they, they got me supplies. They got me what I wanted. And they, I, we came up with stuff. But, and that's where the MTV came from. But I, I know you're watching my timeline. So where where am I supposed to be? <laughs> uh, I, mean, good, I, wanted, I wanted to talk. talk I want, yeah, I want to talk about Vandalia. Yeah. I want to talk about Vandalia okay. a little bit. Vandalia was a, a, a horrible thing to happen. It was just... Um, we were there three hours earlier at the building across the street. Uh, and I'll never forget this. Um, I got on my rig at midnight. We were there earlier for the building across the street for a bullshit run. And I turned to Bobo, Bobby Johnson. And I said, if we get a job tonight, we're going to get fucked. And three hours later, we got fucked. Um, we pull up. Uh, you guys know the story of the fire. Um, where the, the window gave, we had a wind wind driven event. We were um, third dude. We were second. That pick? Like that? Oh yeah, the hallway. Yes, I was waiting for the right time. Boom, boom. So that that's after the job. That was the hallway, and and you, know, you got to realize yeah, a little bit better. What amazes me is on in this hallway. There's no fuel in that hallway. I mean, think about it. It's a it's a hallway. There's no couches. There's no furniture. There's no nothing, and that's what happened to that hallway. And so we we again we pull up. We're we're two floors, three floors below. We're hooking up. As we're trying to get up the stairwell, they're passing firemen over our heads that are burnt. Two ninety got burnt. Two fifty seven got burnt, and we're basically, I mean, almost like a match pit. Because everybody's stuck in that hallway, that the stairwell, and these guys are, are burnt up, and we're trying to get them out before we can go in, but we're shoulder to shoulder, and we basically got these guys out, like they do in the mosh pit, where you you push them over your head and get them down, and um, my nozzle man, um, who's a chief now, we. Uh, I mean, never forget being at that door and saying, put everything you got on, on. And we bunk it down, you know, flap, you know, the hood, the whole nine yards, gloves in, every, the way they taught you in probie school. And we got against the wall. We had the two and a half. And it was a ballet. We'd go two steps and we'd have to back up a step. And we'd go two steps, back up. And, um, and I don't know who it was. Um, there was an engine behind us that had another line. They were putting it over our heads and they were helping us. And I lost my my nozzle man, fiber alerts going off. I bring the next guy up and we start. And we're just trying to get to the apartment door. And we just get, I mean, it was, you know, you got two and a half. And That's we incredible. are doing anything. We are, it's two, the two fire. Lines. You got right. two lines. I was just gonna say, there's two lines in the bottom of the floor here, right? Yeah, and we, and yeah, we got there's two up. lines, and they and they and they still couldn't move more than two steps at a time. We're we're getting eaten up. That's and crazy. It was insane. And we we're against the wall, and you don't know, it's a, it's concrete brick, so it's a pizza oven. You know, so you lean on that wall, you're getting burnt, just because you leaned on the wall. And 
Chris Chris Joyce was now he was he was the novel man towards the second part, and the two of us we did the best we could, and we got to the door. And when we got to the door, we made the turn. Now we start hitting the fire. The seat, yeah. Because we're just we're just dilly dallying in the torch. We're not at the seat of the fire. But now I'm out of air. Joyce is out of air. And it was a guy from Rescue Two. I don't know his name. I apologize. And he comes up behind me, and he goes, "I got it." I says, "You got it." He says, yeah, I said, because we're done. And he took it and he must have went three feet and the fire was out because he got to the seat of the fire. But I, I, I never I never saw in my career fire from the floor to the ceiling. You always had that foot on the bottom that you could maybe make out or get down. The fire was from the floor to the ceiling and it was insane. I, I mean, we got burnt up. Then we bring out, and the scary part was Cavalieri, Bohan, Bob. They weren't burnt. They died from the inside out. They got hit with the blast, and when they brought Cavalieri out, he had nothing wrong with him. But he cooked from the inside out, which wow. is insane. Right. You know? um, and that was another fire where you start talking about it, and guy says, yeah, yeah, I, I was in whatever company, and that was me next to you, and you're like, Huh. Yeah, you just don't know. You're just in the hallway of trying to do whatever you can do, man. So I, I wound up getting involved with the wind driven event thing. There's a, that one picture you have of me and uh, Governor's Island uh, doing the burns. And, uh, you know, that's where we came up with the floor below nozzle and the, the and blanket. The, the blanket. I still believe the blanket is the greatest thing in the world. The curtain is awesome, but the blanket. Is the end all, and if no, but nobody wanted to carry it, nobody wanted to be the responsible person for it, and politics got involved. But the blanket was the greatest thing, <coughs> and it worked. And but again, whatever. But I'll tell you, I was going to tell you a funny story about this, and I forgot. Oh, so I'm out there, we're doing all these tests, and the company comes out with this potassium, basically hand grenade. And um, basically, they wanted wanted us to throw it in the window, and it would ignite, and it would smother the fire. And the idea was the potassium would remove the oxygen, and the fire would go. And you know, we're all looking at it, and they, the guy says, "All right, this is what I want you to do. You're going to go to the floor above. You're going to lower the the grenade down to the window, mark the, the cord." You're going to pull it back up, and then you're going to throw the grenade out the window, and the rope will pull it back into the window, let go, and it'll go into the building. And and without mentioning names, the union's looking at me, and they're going, I don't know if he's going to be able to pull this off. This is going to be bad, and I'm getting the nod that this can't work. And it was stupid. You know, in the real life, it was stupid. You know, we did try it, and we did give it a real try at the rock, and it, it would definitely go off it would knock the fire down but then within if it's wind driven within 30 seconds we're back into old shit so anyway again i'm not mentioning the name so i'm up on the floor above and we're doing the whole thing and the unions are out in front and the, the you know the all the scrambled egg hats are out in front and, <laughs> and <laughs> you know, we, we we start the <laughs> event and the fire's going okay and you the guys from uh you know, UV, well, not UV, UL, University Laboratories, they're out there, and they all their things. And I measure, and I throw, and I let go, Let's and go, the grand go. lands, and the grand lands right in front of the command post, and it <laughs> 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 and I knew that one. <laughs> and and uh, that, that's when the union was my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, you know, again, I, you know, some of the craziest ideas are the best thing. So, you, you know, you got to try. You got to try it. Yeah, of course. You, you never know. But, uh, yeah, that was, uh, but I, again, that was another program that I was, I was, I just, you know, everybody likes to bitch them on in the kitchen. There's the blanket and it works and it, it, it's amazing. And that's the floor below nozzle. 
Um, I was telling you before I, I found the box that was looking for pitches and I found the box of how I made um, fittings for our nozzle because it, it's based on, and I don't, you know, here's an old timer. I'm sure they know the Lorenzo ladder. That's what gave me the idea. The Lorenzo ladder. When Lorenzo. back in the day, I, what was that? Was he Italian? Yes. Lorenzo. <laughs> God, God bless. God bless. Does anybody know what the Lorenzo <laughs> ladder was? <laughs> Not the scaling ladder. Guy? No. No. Not the scaling ladder, right? No. So the Lorenzo ladder was a high rise. It was basically a turn ladder with all bunches of ropes, and you would stick it out the window to go up to the floor above, and you'd tie it off, and you'd go up, and it was a ladder. Hell um, no. <laughs> From, from Manhattan. Yeah. About, it never took off. It's an old WMYF. <laughs> you got that uh, disc now. Look it up. Yeah, look it up. Right. That's it. Tell them, Cap. Get so, on it. That's it. So, but anyway, it, that was the idea behind it. I remember bringing it to Jerry Barber, rest his soul, who I was a very good friend with him. You have that photo. Um, I'm sorry. Even, was, I was trying to find that ladder. <laughs> no, no. Jerry Barber. Um, he was the chief of fire prevention. I remember the idea behind it came to me when, yeah, that's Jerry and Joanne, his wife, that's me and my wife. Um, but Jerry was the chief of fire prevention at the time. And he was the one who said, you know, if we can throw water into the wind droplets into the wind and see if it'll push back into the apartment and actually put water on the fire. And that, and that's how this all rolled. And I, you know, used the idea of Lorenzo out of the stick it out thing and shoot it back into the building. And then the guys who were on this program from the shops, they took it a step further and it just built, you know. And I remember one of the guys in your show mentioning that you got to remember the history. That's It's very important to understand the history and where stuff came from, because that's how stuff moves forward. You know, A couldn't be done. I mean, C could not be done unless A was done first and then B. You can't go right to C. And we, you know, we learned a lot by stuff like this. And then because of Jerry's knowledge and then my experience and then this, that, and the other thing, that whole idea of the nozzle, the floor below nozzle, or as some people call it, the coward stick, um, that's how it, where it came from. And the blanket and the idea of blocking the wind and, and the curtain that the guys down in Rockaway came up with. This is how, you know, the, the, the first idea is not the best idea, but that's where it goes you know and you got to remember stuff like that because only a crazy you're, time time will go up. <laughs> you're not wrong whoever wrote that lying. you're not wrong <laughs> you know he ain't lying you're not lying so you know it, again it, it was good so um that was that was a lot of good came out of a horrible day um and unfortunately you know 170 you got crushed again um, but that was a horrible job. It was just, uh, it was bad from the beginning. And, you know, I, I have a rule and my guys will tell you the third mistake, somebody dies or gets hurt. And that's the bottom line. You go to any fire and you start reading, you know, cause I used to get the NIOSH reports. You used to have to download them or you'd get them. I used to get them mailed to me and now everything's online, but, and I would read them and, you know, I'd read a hundred of them. You know, 90 were because people were too fat and stupid and they fucking, you know, had a heart attack. And then there was the the usual nonsense. And then there was one or two that you'd be able to say, OK, you know what? I can make a drill out of this. I can I can learn from this, you know, um, or just this multiple guy. mistakes keep yeah. happening. Right. Like it just a snowball effect. We d we die from the same thing for the last 200 years. The, the bottom line. We we die firemen die the same way for less. We're we're not making it better. We're trying. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to yank shit and say this is bad. We're trying every day. But if you look at the way guys die, it's the same way. And the two biggest ones are stuff you've never seen before and stuff you get complacent with. Those are the two biggest reasons why we die. Hmm. Because we, we start cutting corners and 90% of the time we win. But when you get lucky, you, you get lucky, you know, and, you know, hitting the reset button at fire is that that was one of the big things that I always did. I always believed in hitting the reset button because if we had two mistakes already, I'm not making the third. 
And lots of times guys make the third because, and they'll blame what the first two, co- and I'm not picking on them, but the first two companies do A and B that are not, let's say, what's supposed to be done. So now you're the third guy. If you build on this, you're just taking this fire down the wrong alley. You need to get this back to reset. Yeah. Somebody's going to wind might, up holding the bag at the that end. That might have happened at that fire, particularly, yes. actually. Well, Again, shit happens. You, yeah, can go yeah. through all the you can go through all the fires that we've had guys die. There's going to be the one that's written in the paper, and then there's going to be the one that's written in the fire you know, department. In the firehouse, right. And then the guys in the firehouse are going to know what really happened. Right. You know, and as long as you go forward, shit happens. Okay. You know, as but, you know, that was... That was just a horrible thing, a horrible day. And, and that was back in the, you know, and guys didn't want to work with me anymore because I, I had to pay a flyer in six a months. Black cloud. Yeah, you're a black cloud. Fuck him. I'm not working with him anymore. With but, Silvino you know, working. I don't know. I'm going to mute you out, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, my uh, face burned off. Yeah. Yeah. But um, and I, I learned a lot. And, you know, as I said, you, you, you have to. And if you stop learning, you're, you're only lying to yourself. I mean, the guys, guys are the greatest guys in the world. The firemen, mm-hmm. they're amazing. And that's what fucks up the whole city. The FDNY is run from the bottom up. It's not run from the top down. All the other city agencies are run from the top down, not the FDNY. No, I agree FDNY with that. is run from the bottom up. And I've met the greatest guys in the world on this job. A couple of okay. screwballs. Oh, a lot of screwballs. A lot of screwballs. Yeah, hey, like this guy. So, so, oh, um, where are you? So, Italy over there? What's going uh, on? Forget about it. Huh? That's me and Liam in Venice, Italy, nice. having a beer, and that's uh, that was a it was a great trip. That was, so we used to get we were invited to Venice, Italy, to row in their regatta, and they taught us how to row a uh, gondola. And we were in their big regatta, but I they there was a one guy that kept on asking me, "Can you get a bagpiper to come with us?" On the trip, because you, you know, the guy. so I call Liam, and I, I Liam to me that there's a class act and a half because that man, I asked him to come. He says, "I'm in, I'm in," and he. Long story short, something came up the week we were supposed to go, and I, I don't remember what it was, but Liam turned it down because he promised me he would go on that trip. Really? Was and, it free? He well, gives. Was he gives <laughs> free? Yeah, yeah, right. Dude, that guy does about. a lot. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> but uh, so uh, me and him, I mean, I thought it was a great idea. The, the Italian and an Irish guy sitting there having a beer in the middle of Venice. Well, I'll we'll get him one day when he retires. We'll get him on the show. He ain't retiring. That, that guy, man. that guy gives a lot to the job, man. He's always done oh that. Right? I mean, countless, countless hours on his yeah. own time. Countless. The our band. Uh, listen, I can't stand the big part. Countless. But, uh, our band is they are unbelievable i have the most respect for them they are like the mariachi right you don't like the bike bagpipe you like the mariachi (laughs) yes i i think they're first of all they're so talented they are probably they're they're amazing and the the reason why you know how talented they are is because if you ever hear another bagpipe band you're like oh my god what the hell is this noise (laughs) but our guys and what they do for this department, oh where they God. are, where they show up. I mean, it, it, and they're they're always on point. They're always on point. Every guy who retires, every guy, any 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 funeral, they show up. Even a couple of guys, they'll show up to something. It's incredible. They're incredible. They are. Listen, they really I'm, are the heart and soul of the job. They are. They are. They are an amazing group of guys. They and their their skill. Is that I when my office when I was running tactical training? I don't know if we have time. I could tell you how I wound up being in charge of tactical as a captain. Uh, let's yeah. talk about let's go back first before we do that. Because so you get assigned to 283 in 98. I don't want to skip that. That's when you you and Sano became mutual partners, right? Right. He, and he, then, he, uh, you guys look the same too, actually. All right. Yeah. So we talked about the ceremony. You you did that mm-hmm. already. So we talked about that, right? All right. So let's so go he, to tactical then. Promoted to captain in one of 05. Well, the one thing, the ceremonial I want to bring up is yeah. when the guys from Prescott died. Probably one of the toughest things I ever did in my life. Um, 
Joe LaPointe, who is another amazing guy who was the heart and soul of this job, gives me a call and says, look, they, they had a bad fire in Arizona. Would you be willing to drive, go down with me and help them with the funerals? I said, Joe, you got it. Just give me the word. All right, we're going Thursday. I said, okay, fine. Calls me back up. We're going Wednesday. I said, Joe, whatever you need. Uh, we're going in 12 hours. Can you be ready? We go. So the four of us, me, Joe LaPointe, Chip, and, oh, uh, God, I, I can't remember. I'm looking at his face right now. Um, Kniff. We get on a plane, and we grab a bunch of equipment, and we fly down. And I'll make a long story short. We live in a basement of a high school for eight days, and we ba- pretty much ran every funeral for those guys. How many guys? 19 guys got killed. Who had to be flown? Because the stump jumpers, they're like lifeguards in the summertime. They're getting $6 an hour, these guys. Um, uh, there's, they made a movie about them. Um, they got caught. And we we flew down there, and we basically, you know, they're all these different uh, ceremonial units who – and I, I, I'm not trying to pick on them. You know, they got the silver helmets and the taps and they're, they're very well organized and stuff. But they didn't have the knowledge that we had from 9-11 on how to do multiple and how to build and how to market and how to get this done. And we basically flew how many guys back to their hometowns, how many guys got picked up at the airport, the hearses, the flags, the ceremonies. That is the, we had one guy who him and his wife had this by a, uh, by a little river was their place that they used to go. So we we basically built an altar for his casket out of wood that we chopped down and we cleared the property and we set up the whole funeral at the at, at, at this lakeside. And you know, it, that was just one of how many we did. And we, you know, we, we would go, get it going, start it. Once it went, we drove to the next one. And then we did, went to the next one. And we, we basically banged them all out and when the last guy was taken from the church and was heading to the cemetery, we all drove two hours, got back on a plane and flew back to New York. Wow. And it was probably one of the most rewarding things that I've ever done in my life. But it was probably the toughest thing I ever did in my life. And I'll never forget that. I still talk to a couple of people that are still down in Arizona um, in Prescott. It was just the I honor. I how many of those guys were 20 years old. I mean, they were holy kids. shit. They were kids. They were they were basically like all lifeguards at Jones Beach. Yeah, they have ages here, right? Yeah. Look at the ages. Yeah. 29, 23. Yeah. The youngest one looks yeah. like 21. Well, it, there's a movie about it. It's, it's again, it, it's another horrible day. But, you know, we, we made a difference to a lot of people, which made a bit. So now, like you were saying, what was the next thing about tactical? Oh. Uh, yeah, so you got promoted to captain and you uh, slipped right so, into the uh, – Santangelo was bugging me all the time. Come on down. Come on down to the rock. Come on. Because I used to ask questions and send him stuff and say, how about this? How about that? So we became friends. And he was like, you know, why don't you come down? I said, I'm never leaving a company. So now I'm a captain. I don't have a company. And I was I was doing a D, D- Domenico round circles. And I went, I went, <laughs> said to me, listen, I need a guy to run Proby School. And I said, look, I'm not your guy for proby school. And he said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, proby school is a, is like fire prevention. You give four years and then you got to retire because everything you signed, you got to get off the job before the lawyers catch up. So I'm like, I'm not the guy for proby school. If you need me, I'll do it. But it's not what I want to do. And he, was, and he says, and then like two days later, Garrity had found Warner, I think it was. And he said to me, all right, I got a guy. Why don't you come for tactical? So um, and my daughter was just born. Um, she was a couple of years old. I'm a newly count captain. I'm sitting there going, this is perfect. Three thirteens a week. I'll be home. I can be with my daughter. Bah, bah, bah. This is perfect. Weekends off. Weekends off. I can work overtime in the 13th when I'm if I want. This is great. My wife thinks it's the greatest thing in the world. I says, I'll be home every night now. Be, oh, that's great. Whatever. So the first day I walk in and 
Crazy Pete. Remember Crazy Pete, the, the Greek guy? Yes, we at the Rock always did uh, the running and everything. The lieutenant grabs me and he tells me everything's wrong with the Rock and just lays it to me. And I'm sitting there going, I'm here for fucking, not even a cup of coffee yet. And I'm in the complaint box. What the fuck's going on? <laughs> Okay, right. repeat, whatever. Uh, you're gonna be able to do a drill. So we go do a drill with a company, a bullshit drill, you know, mass confidence course. And Pete's hammering me on this fucking guy's an asshole. This guy's a dickhead. Pete, okay, all right, whatever. We go have lunch. And they come around the corner and he says, Listen, at uh, three o'clock unit head meeting. I don't even look up because, you know, I'm on my second cup of coffee. Unit head meeting? How the fuck do I care? <laughs> so now uh, I have lunch, go do a drill, doing a drill, doing a mass confidence course again, me and Pete. And over the radio, I hear Captain Savino. Yeah, hey, go ahead. You coming to the meeting? I go, what do you want me for? Uh, Chief Santangelo requested you come to the meeting at three o'clock. I says, well, I'm in the middle of a drill. When I'm done, I'll come. Say, okay. You guys know the conference room, the two giant tables, right? On the ninth floor, uh, the building nine on the second floor. Yeah, yeah. I walk in the back door. There's nobody at the second table. <laughs> the first table is loaded. Not a seat to be found except for one between Santangelo and Garrity. Hmm, for you. What do you think I said? <laughs> I said at the empty table. I was going to say at the empty table, right? <laughs> at the empty table, because I'm sitting there going, I know nothing. There's no nobody's going to ask me something. And Santangelo goes, No, no, come sit here. So I go sit with him, still dumb as a rock, and he starts laying into these unit heads. And I don't know if anybody knows Santangelo. I mean, he is an animated Italian, Vietnam vet. Um, I mean, he's going both barrels, motherfucker. And you fucking thief, you this, you that. I mean, you should be arrested for what you're doing. I, you know, yeah, and I'm sure you've all heard rock stories. So anyway, he keeps on saying, you're no longer the unit head of tactical training. And I want somebody to step up to be the new unit head. And he turned and looked at me. And I'm still counting butterflies. I don't know what the fuck he's talking about. <laughs> he's going, and he's yelling, and every couple of screams, he turns. Mm. And I want somebody to take over tactical training because you're no longer in charge. And this, this. and he'd look at me, and I'm fucked as he man. Oh, no, I'm gone. So finally, I turn to Gary and I go, is he looking for me to run tactical training? <laughs> and he already goes, yes! Bing, 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 bing. So like a five-year-old with his father, I'm pulling on his pants. And he turns, and I go, you want me to do this? He goes, yes. Goes, all right. Captain Slovino is the new unit head. You're all fired. He's bringing his own people in. Blah, 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 blah. So now I got to go home and tell my wife. Remember I was going to do three thirteens? Yeah. Well, now I'm doing eight thirteens. <laughs> I won't be. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and within three hours, I'm now the tactical head unit leader. And I, oh God. But I, I, I embraced it. I loved it. I can't tell you the stuff I learned, the people I met. Um, I always believed that if you didn't put effort into your drill for the guys that were coming here, then you're wasting their time. And that's where the MTV program came in. That MTV was built because I hated Rockaway, Northern Bronx, parts of uh, Manhattan, and there that's it there, and um, Staten Island. They would spend two hours on the road coming to the Rock. It's insane. They're going to put four hours driving. So I talked to Galvin and I'm like, listen, can't we take the, the beaches, parking lots and build training facilities and we'll do it off season with all those stuff. And that's when Santangelo says, you know, I was thinking about building a truck. What do you think can go with this? So I ran with it. 
And if anybody who's been involved in that MTV, the idea the habit trail, it, right? The habit trail, the dog <laughs> cat unit. People hate it. I, still get I saw Ralphie years. Longo go through that. Cap. That's it. Yep. <laughs> it wasn't pretty. It if wasn't if pretty. Ralphie could get through that, anybody <laughs> could get through that. But I don't know if any of you guys ever went to um, the Brooklyn Navy Yard for a drill. Yeah. They had these old sets, and the guy, one guy had put music in the background just to fuck up the radio communication. I thought that was genius. So anyway, when I built this rig, I, I'm going to make this probie school stuff. So you stuff you learned in probie school, but I'm going to make it real life. I put the flashing lights, smoke machines. I put radio communications in there, blasting in your ear. I fuck with the brain. I made it hard. But you're in a fucking truck. Walk the street. You're going to live. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, that was always my belief that training should be harder than real life. Because if training is harder than real life, then when real life comes, you're good. Right. You know, but you as a trainer have to put the effort in. You know, having a company drive out to the rock an hour on the fucking parkway send them to the math confidence course and then send them back home. It's a waste of time. You uh, you know, it's a bullshit drill. It's a, I mean, what are we doing? The rock is the stuff you can't do in quarters. That's what the rock is for. I, I used to do this one drill. I loved it. It, it was a, it took the old Lord tenement. I think it's building four. Dora Cack, the guy you brought up, he was a screwball, but he would do whatever I asked. And he built I would tell him to get a car, put two mannequins in it, into it, smash it, push it into the front door of the old law tenement, and I'm going to light the building on fire with barrels. I'm going to send one engine, one truck. I'm going to dispatch them from the gate, and I'm going to tell you I loved it because they would come around the corner, and you could see the eyes of the lieutenant. <laughs> what <like> the fuck? <laughs> I came out, I go right at the rock. What the fuck is it? And they would pull up to a burning building with a car with mannequins in it, squished one and one. Oh, 1075. Okay, you're on your own. You know, and they would they would do it. They would get the hearse tool, who would tap the fire, who would do this, they would do a search, they would do it. And the, the, the most rewarding part of that drill was when I would call the drill over. I didn't have to talk to them. They were talking to each other for an hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could tell like they were they, they got just, something out of it, right? They, they, and that that was, you know, that's what I loved doing. I mean, when you did the PSS, I built a drill that I almost killed sixty and seventeen because I I, I lit the fucking building on fire. I lit it behind them, <laughs> and they had to jump out. It was Walt from Seventeen Truck, who was a class act. I he squared away, and you know. They had to jump. They had to deploy and they had to jump. <laughs> and, you know, I go, what do you think? He goes, he goes, that was insane, but that was probably one of the best drills I ever fucking had. I, said, I almost died, but it was I almost died. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> it was good. Chief, I, Chief Bro used know. to say, he used to yell at all the guys when, when yeah. I was out at the, the rescue school. Chief yeah. Bro used to say, yell at the guys. He's like, this is Disney World, bro. This is That's Disney it. World. Yeah, it is. It is. But uh, I... I I, I had a very charmed career. I was very lucky. Uh, I had great people around me. And I had guys like Galvin who, you know, even if he disagreed with me, would give me the opportunity to do it. You go, I don't think it's a good idea, but if you think it is, I'll support you. You know, and he did. And he he was, you know, I got to work with Kill Duff, Kill, another class act. And I bring that oh, up. Who he knows, knows Ed, him is Ed. Ed, I'm just say Ed, right? Ed. 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 Me, and, me and Ed are like that, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great, that's uh, Louis on top. Really that's Louis on top. He, <laughs> he, you know, he, I, he was just. I, I mean, this is the story I bring up, and I, that that timeline of the firemen that I the picture I gave you of all the different yeah. uniforms that we had, and under each one, it says, "I, you know, it's time to retire. These guys are fucking the job up." Yeah. And th there's a lot of truth there. I mean, you just think of the fact that when Kilduff and Galvin came out of Proby School. Right. Probably with their, you know, college sweaters 
going into a firehouse full of Vietnam vets. What do you think they said about those two? Look at these fucking guys. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. and two of the greatest guys in the world. And that's, and it, so this job, you know, we all have our window. And it was fucked up when we got there. And it's going to be fucked up when we leave. <laughs> but it's still the greatest job in the world. Yeah. It's still awesome. So the big red dog goes up and the big red dog goes down. That's it, man. And the truth is, it's the white stuff on the red stuff. No matter whatever you ever pull. I mean, so, so we got to bring this full circle. So you, yes. you wind up going back as the captain of 127. Correct. In 2007. What yeah. was that like for you? I, well, I was, there wasn't, a, there was only a couple of guys left that I worked with. So, it wasn't like I went back to, you know, the exact same thing. And and I had, I had ideas when I was a fireman there. And I, when I came back, I was able to implement a lot of them, which made me very happy. I, I tried to make the firehouse better. I I, I tried to make the men better because um, I, I learned. Um, I was very lucky. Uh, I was part of the IMT, and I got to go down to uh, Emmitsburg. Um, for a leadership class and one of the things that i really learned is that you know i have a responsibility to teach lieutenants how to be lieutenants and firemen how to be firemen but the truth of the matter is that after i teach them how to be firemen i need to teach them how to be a lieutenant and my lieutenants i have to teach how to be captains because in the military you know back in the day you're charging a hill and if you're the sergeant and, and the lieutenant gets killed guess what you're in charge and it was something that stuck with me. And so that's when I turned the nozzle and said, okay, now I got to teach Longo how to be a captain. You know, now I have to teach my fireman not only to be fireman, but now I got to say, okay, now, but what do you do here? What do you do here? You know, well, uh, you know, that's the lieutenant. No, no, you know, that's your job now. You, you know, you need to know because – you know, one of the things I learned at an early age is I want to my I want to know what my boss needs because if I can give what my boss needs to him, I'm an asset to him. You know, so if I know what my superior needs, and I can produce that for him, well, now I'm an asset. I'm not a liability to him, and I and 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 this gets better. And and you know what I'm saying? We're, we're working at a goal here. You know, that's the whole idea of this. The idea of this whole fire department so everybody goes home it's not to say who had the most fires who had the most runs who had the prettiest rig who's got the biggest dent no it's that we all get to go home and we all get to retire you know how many guys on this job that's one of the reasons another reason why i retired how many guys you know i mean great guys that did 40 years and made this job amazing and died six months after they retired yeah it's crazy my father my father did yeah so i mean that's hard I have a father and my brother both didn't yeah. in the last two years. Yeah. And that's not what this is about. Yeah. You know? So, you know, I'm sorry for your family, but the truth of the matter is you got you got we all have our window. You know, what they taught you in probably school is to make this job a little bit better than the day you walked in. And when you, you get to that point, you gotta pass the buck. Say, okay, it's your turn, you know, because now I got to reap the benefits. So well, otherwise, what are we doing? You know? I got to reap the benefits. I know a guy yeah. like that, Ruff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, did te- you were a captain there for 10 years, huh? Wait, I, I just yeah, thought it was yeah. a long time. 10 years. And you, yes. Uh, did anybody tell you about the cannoli hut that we built? No, I don't. T- tell me about the cannoli hut. <laughs> <laughs> so on the back, I basically built the rock. I built the fucking... The guys did. And that was the other thing I learned. Never tell a guy how to do it. Tell a guy what you want done. Mm-hmm. And then sit back and be amazed they'll at how run they with do it. it. Yeah, they'll run with it, man. And they they will make it bigger, better than I would ever come up with. So um, we built a, a PSS tower. We built uh, forcible entry doors back there. We had cutting stations. We had all these fucking things in the backyard. We had a two-story tower in the back. And then when Pujak died, um, falling off the ladder, I called my good friend. At, uh, at, um, Andy Diamond and I says I need a, an aerial and he goes what he says, I need an aerial I says we're a towel ladder my men get detailed to aerial ladders 
I want to practice and going up the ladder. We got to practice. So he said, "All right." And we, oh, we shit. And, and I put an aerial up to the two story. So it was actually almost three stories up. We had he gave us the last section, and again, like I said, this is what I want. And I had two welders. They put springs and all the stuff. So when you went up, it bounced. We put no, wires. Oh shit! Shit! I didn't know that. Oh yeah. So we had this all in the backyard, and it was like, you know, and it, it, here's the thing I. You know, two things I stole from rescue when I worked in rescue five back when they were allowed to be detailed to a rescue company as an covering officer. I made every day the junior man gave a drill at roll call. So at roll call, the junior man had to get a tool and present it to the company. I love it. That's, a rookie a drill. That's my drill, Cap. There you go. <laughs> so, well... I, what I watched was these guys went deep. I mean, they went into going and getting like the you know, the, 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 the the stats of the saw and giving me RPM ratios and all that stuff. And it was they were just trying to outdo the next guy, and it turned into an unbelievable. You know, it was an hour and a half. You know, roll call without even trying, right? Without even trying. Seven thirty. And the other thing I saw from rescue, which it was a thing that drove me nuts. I hated. That at six o'clock and nine o'clock, there would be 140 saws roaring, <laughs> and nobody knew if it could cut. <coughs> True, so, you know. So every day, a different tool had to go under a load, and we and one guy made a, a chart. So every Monday was the saw; they had to cut something. Every Tuesday, you had to lift something with the hearse tool. Every Wednesday, you had to cut something with the chair. And, you know, it'd be, and I can tell you, when we first implemented it, we put all the fucking tools out of service because they fucking suck. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that I can you, believe. You know, that I can but, believe. Yeah, but better, that, it's better to do it then and on the scene somewhere. You're a thousand percent right. You know, it's like guys who check their mask and say, oh, you good? Yeah, I, I'm still in the green. No, is it full? No, it's in the green. Well, why would you want to give up? Three minutes. minutes. Yeah, right. Exactly. I mean, and we're not paying for it. Mm. You know, when I got a job, you bought your gear, so you made it work. But when they had quarter for nothing, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. now you're getting it for nothing, and you can't figure out how to not have a hole in your shirt. Yeah. Come on, you know. So you know, these are all things that I learned from different firehouses that we implemented in 127 because. I came back as the captain and these were things that bothered me as a fireman, you know, that I was like, uh, uh, no. but I, I always hurricanes that cap. Uh, no, we went through a bunch of names. We were, when I first got there, we were the hillside Hilton because we had like four or five guys that came out of the Harlem Hilton. So we were the hillside Hilton. And then when cool Runnings came out, we were cool Runnings for a while. That's when Clancy died. There's that famous photo of the side of the rig. Because we had Tony Meyer. He was a rescue four guy. Um, he was out of his mind. He was a great fireman. You know, he'd run around the firehouse, let your tools do your talking. And, you know, uh, Sunday night's taxpayer night. And he would paint. That was his therapy. And, I mean, but crazy stuff. Like, at like three in the morning, he painted the steps. Now, 305, we get a run. And that is Prince yellow paint all over the fucking firehouse. But he didn't paint one side. He painted the whole thread. And I'd be like, Tony, how the fuck did we get that? You know, but and at one time he painted on the front of the grill, towering over the rest. And the fucking nice. senior sofa got so pissed off. And then one time we get the rig back in the rock, and now it says towering over the rest rooms. You know. Oh was, no. But he would he would paint everything. And it, it was it was it was insane. So, but he painted that cool runnings, um, and then the hurricanes came from a couple of different places. We had Bobby Garone was a big baseball. We, you know, we actually, when I was a young fireman, we actually made it to the semifinals of this the uh, softball, the FDNY softball. We played in the Bronx in that, that you know the round robin. We didn't win, but um, we we got to we we made it to the show, and. Um, Tony, he, he was he was fucking insane. Uh, I'm trying to remember what I was talking about now. I lost my train. Of hurricane. Oh, the hurricane. So, Bobby Garone had a like a you know they used to do ripouts. 
So they were called the Hurricanes, his company. And then we used to have the Hurricane inning. That was the fifth inning. That's when we were going to score all our runs. So that was like the Hurricane inning. So it, it kind of took off. And then when I left, it became that's when they started putting the flags. And now it's it's stuck. Now it's uh, that's back it. To, yeah. You're the Hurricanes, baby. But we we check we yeah we we went in my career. We changed names a lot, and that was the big thing I found with Queens. It wasn't the history that I learned when I worked in the Bronx and I worked in Brooklyn. The firehouses had history. They had, you know, they they they, they had a lot of tradition, right? Exactly. Yeah, a lot of traditions, a lot of history, a lot of you know stories that went back to the 1800s. And Queens didn't have that, right? And that, that was the reason why I, I stole a lot of ideas uh, doing borrowed. Work. Borrowed. Borrowed, borrowed. Because <laughs> I had the privilege of working in other boroughs. And that was one of the reasons why I really didn't like doing vacations and things like that. Because I, I didn't mind. where I, I loved working in different firehouses every tour because I, I would learn stuff. Mm. That's how they do it here. I mean, I, I learned when I in Rockaway about taking the lengths up to the balcony, hooking them up and throwing off the balcony as opposed to doing a road stretch bring, to bring it back up. It was another option. And where I was able to, you know, use that was when they were doing the buildings over, the stamp pipes over on, and when I was in 283, between us and 231 and Blake Sutter, um, and we were trying to figure out ways. I actually helped write the bulletin about hooking up the lanes to two and a half, throwing it out the window. Because you take two lanes, you're up on the tenth floor already. You know, you don't need the bottle stretch; ain't gonna work. You know, so now you got three lanes. Now you're up to the, you know, you're you're at the thirtieth floor. Now you can pull pull lanes up. So that one too. I yeah, I acquired. Acquired it. <laughs> acquired like it. But, it. You know, it, again, it's just a matter of just getting, you know, being involved and not fucking walking away and saying, no, we can make it better. I mean, we got a lot of guys, you know, especially after 9-11, that are trying to fix stuff that's not broke. You know, but there is a lot of things that we can make better or we can make easier or we can make you know, go faster. And yep. you gotta get involved, Kubi. I hear it. it. I hear you. So, wow. I went way too long. That's all right, kid. That's, that's all right. Great. <laughs> Had me laughing the whole time. I love it. <laughs> But I think it's yeah. that time, Ruff, at 2.26. Yeah. What time is it? What time God is it? it? It's, the, it's time for... Ready? Yes. The old the old tip. school tip, tip of the day. 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 All right, Cap. Take it away. All right. So I, I wrote down a, a couple of things. Uh, I hope you don't mind. It's three of them. Do it. Um, so, you know, we had, especially after 9-11, we had to rebuild the fire department. Um we got a lot, a lot of people that were teaching if A, do B, if B, do C, and, and it drove me nuts. Um, it basically know what your job is and what you're trying to accomplish. Because if you know what you're trying to accomplish, you'll get there. You'll know what you need to do. I mean, a lot, the reason I'm saying this is if you're the roof man, what's your goal as a roof man? Well, I need to vent. I need to search. I need to do this. Okay, do I really care how you get to the roof? No, I, you need to know what you need to accomplish. If you know what you need to accomplish, then you, you'll get there. You'll do the right thing. And, and talking about doing the right thing, I had it written on the wall in the firehouse, and it said, letter 127, where you do the right thing even if nobody's watching. And that goes back to resetting the fire doing what you're expected because if you're first do and i do what i'm supposed to do second do can come in and augment me they can make it better we can move this fire to the next line if you don't do the right thing you're causing a really bad situation you really need to understand that so don't don't look about while well, people are watching you know i, I had a job where some lady in the back of the house is screaming and the engine office is back there. Okay, stretch the line here, stretch the line here. I'm like, no, we got to go through the front door. He's like, what do you mean? I go, that's what the way this is written. Through the front door, we'll get there, we'll put the fire out. Because everybody else coming in is going to act or do their job based on us doing what's right. And if we do what's right and you do what's right, everybody gets to go home. And that's, that's the whole 
gist of this. This is the whole idea of this fire department. We're firemen, but our goal is to get home to our family and enjoy life. So just do the right thing. Do what you're supposed to do. If you don't like the rules, you change the rules. You don't do what you want. That's really important. So I hope that helps. I don't. It didn't help me, so I hope it helps you. <laughs> <laughs> I like the change in the rule part. I'm in on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, wait, well, he's a rule breaker from the start. He's getting transferred on the first five minutes of his career, bro. <laughs> yeah. I, I told you it didn't work for me. I was, just, that might be up there. I think that might be the record. I don't know. We've had a few guys that got switched out pretty quick, but I think that might Four be the hours, record. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. Cap, it was, uh, it was an awesome show, man. Enjoy uh, it a lot. Great story, I appreciate Cap. it. I hope hurt. I... Say I you, I, when, I, when I first called you, ah, what do you want me on the show for? What am I going to talk about? Are you kidding me? I, I listen. I just, I just did my job. So to me, you know, I, I laugh when other people tell stories. I, I, I don't. I love it. I, That's the best part. We laugh when you tell stories. Chief, yeah. Chief Dunn said, "I was just on a magic carpet ride that whole time." That's it. Oh, yeah. that's, the <laughs> that's the truth, yeah. right? It's a magic yeah, yeah. carpet yeah. ride. Yes, that's, that's a great line. line. That's a great line. Well, I hope I did my father proud. I oh, did my yeah. best. You did. That, that's job. what I got. Yeah. It was good to hear those stories too, Cap. I, yeah, I, I, I enjoy that uh, early history. Thank you. Thank oh, you. so we have an unfortunate shout out tonight. Red well, Guns? Yes, sir. Um, firefighter from Playfield, New Jersey. Marquise? What are we saying? Mar Mar I said Marquez uh, Hudson. Marquez Hudson. He's 32 years old. old. Three kids behind. Rest in peace. I'm the line of duty, so we're getting the five bells. Rest in peace, brother. What a shame. Rest in peace, brother. Yeah. You got anything, Ruffy? No, that's it, man. What a Cap face. did it. He did it. He ran it. Uh, he ran it hard. Hey. Put it away. What? What do we got Thursday? Oh, what do we got Thursday? Oh, the eighty-eight-year-old guy, right, or something? Oh yeah, we got uh, Solman, Captain Solman, Solan, oh, Captain Solan, Solan, Solan. 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 That's Thinking about Paulie, eighty-eight yeah. years old or something like that. Man, oh man, that's going to be interesting. Yes, his, Cap son's, his son was a one hundred and three guy. He's going to be on to. He's going to help him along the way. One hundred and one. One hundred and three. One hundred and three. One hundred and three. Where? Where? Oh, I'll boy, just say. Oh, one, if people ask me where I work, <laughs> I tell them follow the Cap, are you still in New York? Cap? <laughs> yeah, I'm out in uh, Melville. Oh, you coming to the to the uh, volley show on this weekend or what? I just saw you a thing that it's the it's Friday. Friday, this Saturday, weekend. Sunday. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, Saturday I'm leaving on vacation, but oh, uh, there you go. It's really good. Aruba, well, man, my favorite place. That's you. my favorite really? place, man. It's, it's my favorite island. It's, it's, it's up, favorite. It's one, it's I bet one you it's going to be eighty-two and, and breezy. breezy. Yes, <laughs> and no uh, rain. It's one what happy island. That's yes, it, it is. is, and they're not lying. I, I was like, lying. Lying. They ain't lying. It's a Enjoy. great place. It's my favorite island. So uh, I, I saw that you did Friday. So uh, I would like to come and say thank you to you guys. So you we'll be there. Yeah, maybe we'll have a couple of pops. Allegedly, we'll see what happens. Allegedly. I'll bring the bourbon cap. You're the man. You're the man. We. I got you. I got All you. Nice. Got great show. Uh, yes. Cap, hold on. Don't go anywhere yet. Don't go uh, yet. We'll see you cool cats on a Thursday night. Until then, stay low. Yo. All right, everybody. We'll see you at the big one. Thanks again, Cap. All right, guys. Thank be you. safe. Hook up and look up, baby. Oh, nice. what he came up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, All right. <laughs> Good night, everyone.